Section 14 of Evolution Creatrice by Henri Bergson, translated by Arthur Mitchell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3, Part 4. This long analysis was necessary to show how the real can pass from tension to extension and from freedom to mechanical necessity by way of inversion. It was not enough to prove that this relation between the two terms is suggested to us at once by consciousness and by sensible experience it was necessary to prove that the geometrical order has no need of explanation being purely and simply the suppression of the inverse order and for that it was indispensable to prove that suppression is always a substitution and is even necessarily conceived as such it is the requirements of practical life alone that suggest to us here a way of speaking that deceives us both as to what happens in things and as to what is present to our thought we must now examine more closely the inversion whose consequences we have just described. What then is the principle that has only to let go its tension, may we say to detend, in order to extend, the interruption of the cause here being equivalent to a reversal of the effect? For want of a better word we have called it consciousness. But we do not mean the narrowed consciousness that functions in each of us. Our own consciousness is the consciousness of a certain living being placed in a certain point of space, and though it does indeed move in the same direction as its principle, it is continually drawn the opposite way, obliged though it goes forward to look behind. This retrospective vision is, as we have shown, the natural function of the intellect, and consequently of distinct consciousness. In order that our consciousness shall coincide with something of its principle, it must detach itself from the already made and attach itself to the being made. It needs that, turning back on itself and twisting on itself, the faculty of seeing should be made to be one with the act of willing, a painful effort which we can make suddenly, doing violence to our nature, but cannot sustain more than a few moments. In free action, when we contract our whole being in order to thrust it forward, we have the more or less clear consciousness of motives and of impelling forces, and even, at rare moments, of the becoming by which they are organized into an act. But the pure willing, the current that runs through this matter, communicating life to it, is a thing which we hardly feel, which at most we brush lightly as it passes. Let us try, however, to install ourselves within it, if only for a moment. Even then, it is an individual and fragmentary will that we grasp. To get to the principle of all life, as also of all materiality, we must go further still. Is it impossible? No, by no means. The history of philosophy is there to bear witness. There is no durable system that is not, at least in some of its parts, vivified by intuition. Dialectic is necessary to put intuition to the proof, necessary also in order that intuition should break itself up into concepts and so be propagated to other men. But all it does, often enough, is to develop the result of that intuition which transcends it. The truth is, the two procedures are of opposite direction. The same effort by which ideas are connected with ideas causes the intuition which the ideas were storing up to vanish. The philosopher is obliged to abandon intuition once he has received from it the impetus and to rely on himself to carry on the movement by pushing the concepts one after another. But he soon feels he has lost foothold. He must come into touch with intuition again. He must undo most of what he has done. In short, dialectic is what ensures the agreement of our thought with itself. But by dialectic, which is only a relaxation of intuition, many different agreements are possible while there is only one truth. Intuition, if it could be prolonged beyond a few instants, would not only make the philosopher agree with his own thought, but also all philosophers with each other. Such as it is, fugitive and incomplete, it is, in each system, what is worth more than the system and survives it. The object of philosophy would be reached if this intuition could be sustained, generalized, and, above all, assured of external points of reference in order not to go astray. To that end, a continual coming and going is necessary between nature and mind. When we put back our being into our will, and our will itself into the impulsion it prolongs, we understand, we feel, that reality is a perpetual growth, a creation pursued without end. Our will already performs this miracle. Every human work in which there is invention, every voluntary act in which there is freedom, every movement of an organism that manifests spontaneity, brings something new into the world. True, these are only creations of form. How could they be anything else? We are not the vital current itself. We are this current already loaded with matter, that is, with congealed parts of its own substance which it carries along its course. 
in the composition of a work of genius as in a simple free decision we do indeed stretch the spring of our activity to the utmost and thus create what no mere assemblage of materials could have given what assemblage of curves already known can ever be equivalent to the pencil stroke of a great artist but there are none the less elements here that pre-exist and survive their organization but if a simple arrest of the action that generates form could constitute matter are not the original lines drawn by the artist themselves already the fixation and as it were congealment of a movement a creation of matter would be neither incomprehensible nor inadmissible for we seize from within we live at every instant a creation of form and it is just in those cases in which the form is pure and in which the creative current is momentarily interrupted that there is a creation of matter consider the letters of the alphabet that enter into the composition of everything that has ever been written we do not conceive that new letters spring up and come to join themselves to the others in order to make a new poem but that the poet creates the poem and that human thought is thereby made richer we understand very well this creation is a simple act of the mind and action has only to make a pause instead of continuing into a new creation in order that of itself it may break up into words which dissociate themselves into letters which are added to all the letters there are already in the world thus that the number of atoms composing the material universe at a given moment should increase runs counter to our habits of mind contradicts the whole of our experience but that a reality of quite another order which contrasts with the atom as the thought of the poet with the letters of the alphabet should increase by sudden additions is not inadmissible and the reverse of each addition might indeed be a world which we then represent to ourselves symbolically as an assemblage of atoms the mystery that spreads over the existence of the universe comes in great part from this that we want the genesis of it to have been accomplished at one stroke or the whole of matter to be eternal whether we speak of creation or posit an uncreated matter it is the totality of the universe that we are considering at once at the root of this habit of mind lies the prejudice which we will analyze in our next chapter the idea common to materialists and to their opponents that there is no really acting duration and that the absolute matter or mind can have no place in concrete time in the time which we feel to be the very stuff of our life from which it follows that everything is given once for all and that it is necessary to posit from all eternity either material multiplicity itself or the act creating this multiplicity given in block in the divine essence once this prejudice is eradicated the idea of creation becomes more clear for it is merged in that of growth but it is no longer then of the universe in its totality that we must speak why should we speak of it the universe is an assemblage of solar systems which we have every reason to believe analogous to our own no doubt they are not absolutely independent of one another our sun radiates heat and light beyond the farthest planet and on the other hand our entire solar system is moving in a definite direction as if it were drawn there is then a bond between the worlds but this bond may be regarded as infinitely loose in comparison with the mutual dependence which unites the parts of the same world among themselves so that it is not artificially for reasons of mere convenience that we isolate our solar system nature itself invites us to isolate it as living beings we depend on the planet on which we are and on the sun that provides for it but on nothing else as thinking beings we may apply the laws of our physics to our own world and extend them to each of the worlds taken separately but nothing tells us that they apply to the entire universe nor even that such an affirmation has any meaning for the universe is not made but is being made continually it is growing perhaps indefinitely by the addition of new worlds let us extend then to the whole of our solar system the two most general laws of our science the principle of conservation of energy and that of its degradation limiting them however to this relatively closed system and to other systems relatively closed let us see what will follow we must remark first of all that these two principles have not the same metaphysical scope the first is a quantitative law and consequently relative in part to our methods of measurement it says that in a system presumed to be closed the total energy that is to say the sum of its kinetic and potential energy remains constant now if there were only kinetic energy in the world or even if there were besides kinetic energy only one single kind of potential energy but no more the artifice of measurement would not make the law artificial the law of the conservation of energy would express indeed that something is preserved in constant quantity 
but there are in fact energies of various kinds and the measurement of each of them has evidently been so chosen as to justify the principle of conservation of energy convention therefore plays a large part in this principle although there is undoubtedly between the variations of the different energies composing one and the same system a mutual dependence which is just what has made the extension of the principle possible by measurements suitably chosen if therefore the philosopher applies this principle to the solar system complete he must at least soften its outlines the law of the conservation of energy cannot here express the objective permanence of a certain quantity of a certain thing but rather the necessity for every change that is brought about to be counterbalanced in some way by a change in an opposite direction that is to say even if it governs the whole of our solar system the law of the conservation of energy is concerned with the relationship of a fragment of this world to another fragment rather than with the nature of the whole it is otherwise with the second principle of thermodynamics the law of the degradation of energy does not bear essentially on magnitudes no doubt the first idea of it arose in the thought of carnot out of certain quantitative considerations on the yield of thermic machines unquestionably too the terms in which clausius generalized it were mathematical and a calculable magnitude entropy was in fact the final conception to which he was led such precision is necessary for practical applications but the law might have been vaguely conceived and if absolutely necessary it might have been roughly formulated even though no one had ever thought of measuring the different energies of the physical world even though the concept of energy had not been created essentially it expresses the fact that all physical changes have a tendency to be degraded into heat and that heat tends to be distributed among bodies in a uniform manner in this less precise form it becomes independent of any convention it is the most metaphysical of the laws of physics since it points out without interposed symbols without artificial devices of measurements the direction in which the world is going it tells us that changes that are visible and heterogeneous will be more and more diluted into changes that are invisible and homogeneous and that the instability to which we owe the richness and variety of the changes taking place in our solar system will gradually give way to the relative stability of elementary vibrations continually and perpetually repeated just so with a man who keeps up his strength as he grows old but spends it less and less in actions and comes in the end to employ it entirely in making his lungs breathe and his heart beat from this point of view a world like our solar system is seen to be ever exhausting something of the mutability it contains in the beginning it had the maximum of possible utilization of energy this mutability has gone on diminishing unceasingly whence does it come we might at first suppose that it has come from some other point of space but the difficulty is only set back and for this external source of mutability the same question springs up true it might be added that the number of worlds capable of passing mutability to each other is unlimited that the sum of mutability contained in the universe is infinite that there is therefore no ground on which to seek its origin or to foresee its end a hypothesis of this kind is as irrefutable as it is indemonstrable but to speak of an infinite universe is to admit a perfect coincidence of matter with abstract space and consequently an absolute externality of all the parts of matter in relation to one another we have seen above what we must think of this theory and how difficult it is to reconcile with the idea of a reciprocal influence of all the parts of matter on one another an influence to which indeed it itself makes appeal again it might be supposed that the general instability has arisen from a general state of stability that the period in which we now are and in which the utilizable energy is diminishing has been preceded by a period in which the mutability was increasing and that the alternations of increase and diminution succeed each other forever this hypothesis is theoretically conceivable as has been demonstrated quite recently but according to the calculations of boltzmann the mathematical improbability of it passes all imagination and practically amounts to absolute impossibility in reality the problem remains insoluble as long as we keep on the ground of physics for the physicist is obliged to attach energy to extended particles and even if he regards the particles only as reservoirs of energy he remains in space he would belie his role if he sought the origin of these energies in an extraspatial process it is there however in our opinion that it must be sought is it extension in general that we are considering in abstracto extension we said appears only as a tension which is interrupted or are we considering the concrete reality that fills this extension 
the order which reigns there and which is manifested by the laws of nature is an order which must be born of itself when the inverse order is suppressed a detention of the will would produce precisely this suppression lastly we find that the direction which this reality takes suggests to us the idea of a thing unmaking itself such no doubt is one of the essential characters of materiality what conclusion are we to draw from all this if not that the process by which this thing makes itself is directed in a contrary way to that of physical processes and that it is therefore by its very definition immaterial the vision we have of the material world is that of a weight which falls no image drawn from matter properly so called will ever give us the idea of the weight rising but this conclusion will come home to us with still greater force if we press nearer to the concrete reality and if we consider no longer only matter in general but within this matter living bodies all our analyses show us in life an effort to remount the incline that matter descends in that they reveal to us the possibility the necessity even of a process the inverse of materiality creative of matter by its interruption alone the life that evolves on the surface of our planet is indeed attached to matter if it were pure consciousness a fortiori if it were superconsciousness it would be pure creative activity in fact it is riveted to an organism that subjects it to the general laws of inert matter but everything happens as if it were doing its utmost to set itself free from these laws it has not the power to reverse the direction of physical changes such as the principle of carnot determines it it does however behave absolutely as a force would behave which left to itself would work in the inverse direction incapable of stopping the course of material changes downwards it succeeds in retarding it the evolution of life really continues as we have shown an initial impulsion this impulsion which has determined the development of the chlorophyllian function in the plant and of the sensory motor system in the animal brings life to more and more efficient acts by the fabrication and use of more and more powerful explosives now what do these explosives represent if not a storing up of the solar energy the degradation of which energy is thus provisionally suspended on some of the points where it was being poured forth the usable energy which the explosive conceals will be expended of course at the moment of the explosion but it would have been expended sooner if an organism had not happened to be there to arrest its dissipation in order to retain it and save it up as we see it today at the point to which it was brought by a scission of the mutually complementary tendencies which it contained within itself life is entirely dependent on the chlorophyllian function of the plant this means that looked at in its initial impulsion before any scission life was a tendency to accumulate in a reservoir as do especially the green parts of vegetables with a view to an instantaneous effective discharge like that which an animal brings about something that would have otherwise flowed away it is like an effort to raise the weight which falls true it succeeds only in retarding the fall but at least it can give us an idea of what the raising of the weight was let us imagine a vessel full of steam at a high pressure and here and there in its sides a crack through which the steam is escaping in a jet the steam thrown into the air is nearly all condensed into little drops which fall back and this condensation and this fall represent simply the loss of something an interruption a deficit but a small part of the jet of steam subsists uncondensed for some seconds it is making an effort to raise the drops which are falling it succeeds at most in retarding their fall so from an immense reservoir of life jets must be gushing out unceasingly of which each falling back is a world the evolution of living species within this world represents what subsists of the primitive direction of the original jet and of an impulsion which continues itself in a direction the inverse of materiality but let us not carry too far this comparison it gives us but a feeble and even deceptive image of reality for the crack the jet of steam the forming of the drops are determined necessarily whereas the creation of the world is a free act and the life within the material world participates in this liberty let us think rather of an action like that of raising the arm then let us suppose that the arm left to itself falls back and yet that there subsists in it striving to raise it up again something of the will that animates it in this image of a creative action which unmakes itself we have already a more exact representation of matter in vital activity we see then that which subsists of the direct movement in the inverted movement a reality which is making itself in a reality which is unmaking itself 
Everything is obscure in the idea of creation if we think of things which are created and a thing which creates, as we habitually do, as the understanding cannot help doing. We shall show the origin of this illusion in our next chapter. It is natural to our intellect, whose function is essentially practical, made to present to us things and states rather than changes and acts. But things and states are only views taken by our mind of becoming. There are no things, there are only actions. More particularly, if I consider the world in which we live, I find that the automatic and strictly determined evolution of this well-knit whole is action which is unmaking itself, and that the unforeseen forms which life cuts out in it, forms capable of being themselves prolonged into unforeseen movements, represent the action that is making itself. Now, I have every reason to believe that the other worlds are analogous to ours, that things happen there in the same way. And I know they were not all constructed at the same time, since observation shows me, even today, nebulae in the course of concentration. Now, if the same kind of action is going on everywhere, whether it is that which is unmaking itself or whether it is that which is striving to remake itself, I simply express this probable similitude when I speak of a centre from which worlds shoot out like rockets in a fireworks display. Provided, however, that I do not present this centre as a thing, but as a continuity of shooting out. God thus defined has nothing of the already made. He is unceasing life, action, freedom. Creation, so conceived, is not a mystery. We experience it in ourselves when we act freely. That new things can join things already existing is absurd, no doubt, since the thing results from a solidification performed by our understanding, and there are never any things other than those that the understanding has thus constituted. To speak of things creating themselves would therefore amount to saying that the understanding presents to itself more than it presents to itself, a self-contradictory affirmation, an empty and vain idea. But that action increases as it goes on, that it creates in the measure of its advance, is what each of us finds when he watches himself act. Things are constituted by the instantaneous cut which the understanding practices at a given moment on a flux of this kind. And what is mysterious when we compare the cuts together becomes clear when we relate them to the flux. Indeed, the modalities of creative action, in so far as it is still going on in the organization of living forms, are much simplified when they are taken in this way. Before the complexity of an organism and the practically infinite multitude of interwoven analyses and syntheses it presupposes, our understanding recoils disconcerted that the simple play of physical and chemical forces left to themselves should have worked this marvel we find hard to believe. And if it is a profound science which is at work, how are we to understand the influence exercised on this matter without form by this form without matter? But the difficulty arises from this, that we represent statically ready-made material particles juxtaposed to one another, and also statically an external cause which plasters upon them a skillfully contrived organization. In reality, life is a movement, materiality is the inverse movement, and each of these two movements is simple, the matter which forms a world being an undivided flux, and undivided also the life that runs through it, cutting out in it living beings all along its track. Of these two currents, the second runs counter to the first, but the first obtains all the same something from the second. There results between them a modus vivendi, which is organization. This organization takes, for our senses and for our intellect, the form of parts entirely external to other parts in space and in time. Not only do we shut our eyes to the unity of the impulse which, passing through generations, links individuals with individuals, species with species, and makes of the whole series of the living one single immense wave flowing over matter, but each individual itself seems to us as an aggregate, aggregate of molecules and aggregate of facts. The reason of this lies in the structure of our intellect, which is formed to act on matter from without, and which succeeds by making, in the flux of the real, instantaneous cuts, each of which becomes, in its fixity, endlessly decomposable. Perceiving, in an organism, only parts external to parts, the understanding has the choice between two systems of explanation only, either to regard the infinitely complex, and thereby infinitely well contrived, organization as a fortuitous concatenation of atoms, or to relate it to the incomprehensible influence of an external force that has grouped its elements together. But this complexity is the work of the understanding. This incomprehensibility is also its work. Let us try to see, no longer with the eyes of the intellect alone, which grasps only the already made and which looks from the outside, but with the spirit, 
i mean with that faculty of seeing which is immanent in the faculty of acting and which springs up somehow by the twisting of the will on itself when action is turned into knowledge like heat so to say into light to movement then everything will be restored and into movement everything will be resolved where the understanding working on the image supposed to be fixed of the progressing action shows us parts infinitely manifold and an order infinitely well contrived we catch a glimpse of a simple process an action which is making itself across an action of the same kind which is unmaking itself like the fiery path torn by the last rocket of a fireworks display through the black cinders of the spent rockets that are falling dead from this point of view the general considerations we have presented concerning the evolution of life will be cleared up and completed we will distinguish more sharply what is accidental from what is essential in this evolution the impetus of life of which we are speaking consists in a need of creation it cannot create absolutely because it is confronted with matter that is to say with the movement that is the inverse of its own but it seizes upon this matter which is necessity itself and strives to introduce into it the largest possible amount of indetermination and liberty how does it go to work an animal high in the scale may be represented in a general way we said as a sensory motor nervous system imposed on digestive respiratory circulatory systems etc the function of these latter is to cleanse repair and protect the nervous system to make it as independent as possible of external circumstances but above all to furnish it with energy to be expended in movements the increasing complexity of the organism is therefore due theoretically in spite of innumerable exceptions due to accidents of evolution to the necessity of complexity in the nervous system no doubt each complication of any part of the organism involves many others in addition because this part itself must live and every change in one point of the body reverberates as it were throughout the complication may therefore go on to infinity in all directions but it is the complication of the nervous system which conditions the others in right if not always in fact now in what does the progress of the nervous system itself consist in a simultaneous development of automatic activity and of voluntary activity the first furnishing the second with an appropriate instrument thus in an organism such as ours a considerable number of motor mechanisms are set up in the medulla and in the spinal cord awaiting only a signal to release the corresponding act the will is employed in some cases in setting up the mechanism itself and in the others in choosing the mechanisms to be released the manner of combining them and the moment of releasing them the will of an animal is the more effective and the more intense the greater the number of the mechanisms it can choose from the more complicated the switchboard on which all the motor paths cross or in other words the more developed its brain thus the progress of the nervous system assures to the act increasing precision increasing variety increasing efficiency and independence the organism behaves more and more like a machine for action which reconstructs itself entirely for every new act as if it were made of india rubber and could at any moment change the shape of all its parts but prior to the nervous system prior even to the organism properly so called already in the undifferentiated mass of the amoeba this essential property of animal life is found the amoeba deforms itself in varying directions its entire mass does what the differentiation of parts will localize in a sensory motor system in the developed animal doing it only in a rudimentary manner it is dispensed from the complexity of the higher organisms there is no need here of the auxiliary elements that pass on to motor elements the energy to expend the animal moves as a whole and as a whole also procures energy by means of the organic substances it assimilates thus whether low or high in the animal scale we always find that animal life consists one in procuring a provision of energy two in expending it by means of a matter as supple as possible in directions variable and unforeseen now whence comes the energy from the ingested food for food is a kind of explosive which needs only the spark to discharge the energy it stores who has made this explosive the food may be the flesh of an animal nourished on animals and so on but in the end it is to the vegetable we always come back vegetables alone gather in the solar energy and the animals do but borrow it from them either directly or by some passing it on to others how then has the plant stored up this energy chiefly by the chlorophyllian function a chemicism sui generis of which we do not possess the key and which is probably unlike that of our laboratories the process consists in using solar energy to fix the carbon of carbonic acid and thereby to store this energy as we should store that of a water carrier by employing him to fill an elevated reservoir 
the water once brought up can set in motion a mill or a turbine as we will and when we will each atom of carbon fixed represents something like the elevation of the weight of water or like the stretching of an elastic thread uniting the carbon to the oxygen in the carbonic acid the elastic is relaxed the weight falls back again in short the energy held in reserve is restored when by a simple release the carbon is permitted to rejoin its oxygen so that all life animal and vegetable seems in its essence like an effort to accumulate energy and then to let it flow into flexible channels changeable in shape at the end of which it will accomplish infinitely varied kinds of work this is what the vital impetus passing through matter would fain do all at once it would succeed no doubt if its power were unlimited or if some reinforcement could come to it from without but the impetus is finite and it has been given once for all it cannot overcome all obstacles the movement it starts is sometimes turned aside sometimes divided always opposed and the evolution of the organized world is the unrolling of this conflict the first great scission that had to be effected was that of the two kingdoms vegetable and animal which thus happened to be mutually complementary without however any agreement having been made between them it is not for the animal that the plant accumulates energy it is for its own consumption but its expenditure on itself is less discontinuous and less concentrated and therefore less efficacious than was required by the initial impetus of life essentially directed towards free actions the same organism could not with equal force sustain the two functions at once of gradual storage and sudden use of themselves therefore and without any external intervention simply by the effect of the duality of the tendency involved in the original impetus and of the resistance opposed by matter to this impetus the organisms leaned some in the first direction others in the second to this scission there succeeded many others hence the diverging lines of evolution at least what is essential in them but we must take into account retrogressions arrests accidents of every kind and we must remember above all that each species behaves as if the general movement of life stopped at it instead of passing through it it thinks only of itself it lives only for itself hence the numberless struggles that we behold in nature hence a discord striking and terrible but for which the original principle of life must not be held responsible the part played by contingency in evolution is therefore great contingent generally are the forms adopted or rather invented contingent relative to the obstacles encountered in a given place and at a given moment is the dissociation of the primordial tendency into such and such complementary tendencies which create divergent lines of evolution contingent the arrests and setbacks contingent in large measure the adaptations two things only are necessary one a gradual accumulation of energy two an elastic canalization of this energy in variable and indeterminable directions at the end of which are free acts this twofold result has been obtained in a particular way on our planet but it might have been obtained by entirely different means it was not necessary that life should fix its choice mainly upon the carbon of carbonic acid what was essential for it was to store solar energy but instead of asking the sun to separate for instance atoms of oxygen and carbon it might theoretically at least and apart from practical difficulties possibly insurmountable have put forth other chemical elements which would then have had to be associated or dissociated by entirely different physical means and if the element characteristic of the substances that supply energy to the organism had been other than carbon the element characteristic of the plastic substances would probably have been other than nitrogen and the chemistry of living bodies would then have been radically different from what it is the result would have been living forms without any analogy to those we know whose anatomy would have been different whose physiology also would have been different alone the sensory motor function would have been preserved if not in its mechanism at least in its effects it is therefore probable that life goes on in other planets in other solar systems also under forms of which we have no idea in physical conditions to which it seems to us from the point of view of our physiology to be absolutely opposed if its essential aim is to catch up usable energy in order to expend it in explosive actions it probably chooses in each solar system and on each planet as it does on the earth the fittest means to get this result in the circumstances with which it is confronted that is at least what reasoning by analogy leads to and we use analogy the wrong way when we declare life to be impossible wherever the circumstances with which it is confronted are other than those on the earth the truth is that life is possible wherever energy descends the incline indicated by carnot's law and where a cause of inverse direction can retard the descent that is to say probably in all the worlds suspended from all the stars 
we go further it is not even necessary that life should be concentrated and determined in organisms properly so called that is in definite bodies presenting to the flow of energy ready-made though elastic canals it can be conceived although it can hardly be imagined that energy might be saved up and then expended on varying lines running across a matter not yet solidified every essential of life would still be there since there would still be slow accumulation of energy and sudden release there would hardly be more difference between this vitality vague and formless and the definite vitality we know than there is in our psychical life between the state of dream and the state of waking such may have been the condition of life in our nebula before the condensation of matter was complete if it be true that life springs forward at the very moment when as the effect of an inverse movement the nebula matter appears it is therefore conceivable that life might have assumed a totally different outward appearance and designed forms very different from those we know with another chemical substratum in other physical conditions the impulsion would have remained the same but it would have split up very differently in course of progress and the whole would have travelled another road whether shorter or longer who can tell in any case in the entire series of living beings no term would have been what it now is now was it necessary that there should be a series or terms why should not the unique impetus have been impressed on a unique body which might have gone on evolving this question arises no doubt from the comparison of life to an impetus and it must be compared to an impetus because no image borrowed from the physical world can give more nearly the idea of it but it is only an image in reality life is of the psychological order and it is of the essence of the psychical to enfold a confused plurality of interpenetrating terms in space and in space only is distinct multiplicity possible a point is absolutely external to another point but pure and empty unity also is met with only in space it is that of a mathematical point abstract unity and abstract multiplicity are determinations of space or categories of the understanding whichever we will spatiality and intellectuality being moulded on each other but what is of psychical nature cannot entirely correspond with space nor enter perfectly into the categories of the understanding is my own person at a given moment one or manifold if i declare it one inner voices arise and protest those of the sensations feelings ideas among which my individuality is distributed but if i make it distinctly manifold my consciousness rebels quite as strongly it affirms that my sensations my feelings my thoughts are abstractions which i effect on myself and that each of my states implies all the others i am then we must adopt the language of the understanding since only the understanding has a language a unity that is multiple and a multiplicity that is one but unity and multiplicity are only views of my personality taken by an understanding that directs its categories at me i enter neither into one nor into the other nor into both at once although both united may give a fair imitation of the mutual interpenetration and continuity that i find at the base of my own self such is my inner life and such also is life in general while in its contact with matter life is comparable to an impulsion or an impetus regarded in itself it is an immensity of potentiality a mutual encroachment of thousands and thousands of tendencies which nevertheless are thousands and thousands only when once regarded as outside of each other that is when spatialized contact with matter is what determines this dissociation matter divides actually what was but potentially manifold and in this sense individuation is in part the work of matter in part the result of life's own inclination thus a poetic sentiment which bursts into distinct verses lines and words may be said to have already contained this multiplicity of individuated elements and yet in fact it is the materiality of language that creates it but through the words lines and verses runs the simple inspiration which is the whole poem so among the dissociated individuals one life goes on moving everywhere the tendency to individualize is opposed and at the same time completed by an antagonistic and complementary tendency to associate as if the manifold unity of life drawn in the direction of multiplicity made so much the more effort to withdraw itself on to itself a part is no sooner detached than it tends to reunite itself if not to all the rest at least to what is nearest to it hence throughout the whole realm of life a balancing between individuation and association individuals join together into a society but the society as soon as formed tends to melt the associated individuals into a new organism so as to become itself an individual able in its turn to be part and parcel of a new association 
at the lowest degree of the scale of organisms we already find veritable associations microbial colonies and in these associations according to a recent work a tendency to individuate by the constitution of a nucleus the same tendency is met with again at a higher stage in the protophytes which once having quitted the parent cell by way of division remain united to each other by the gelatinous substance that surrounds them also in those protozoa which begin by mingling their pseudopodia and end by welding themselves together the colonial theory of the genesis of higher organisms is well known the protozoa consisting of one single cell are supposed to have formed by assemblage aggregates which relating themselves together in their turn have given rise to aggregates of aggregates so organisms more and more complicated and also more and more differentiated are born of the association of organisms barely differentiated and elementary in this extreme form the theory is open to grave objections more and more the idea seems to be gaining ground that polyzoism is an exceptional and abnormal fact but it is none the less true that things happen as if every higher organism was born of an association of cells that have subdivided the work between them very probably it is not the cells that have made the individual by means of association it is rather the individual that has made the cells by means of dissociation but this itself reveals to us in the genesis of the individual a haunting of the social form as if the individual could develop only on the condition that its substance should be split up into elements having themselves an appearance of individuality and united among themselves by an appearance of sociality there are numerous cases in which nature seems to hesitate between the two forms and to ask herself if she shall make a society or an individual the slightest push is enough then to make the balance weigh on one side or the other if we take an infusorian sufficiently large such as the stentor and cut it into two halves each containing a part of the nucleus each of the two halves will generate an independent stentor but if we divide it in completely so that a protoplasmic communication is left between the two halves we shall see them execute each from its side corresponding movements so that in this case it is enough that a thread should be maintained or cut in order that life should affect the social or the individual form thus in rudimentary organisms consisting of a single cell we already find that the apparent individuality of the whole is the composition of an undefined number of potential individualities potentially associated but from top to bottom of the series of living beings the same law is manifested and it is this that we express when we say that unity and multiplicity are categories of inert matter that the vital impetus is neither pure unity nor pure multiplicity and that if the matter to which it communicates itself compels it to choose one of the two its choice will never be definitive it will leap from one to the other indefinitely the evolution of life in the double direction of individuality and association has therefore nothing accidental about it it is due to the very nature of life essential also is the progress to reflection if our analysis is correct it is consciousness or rather supraconsciousness that is at the origin of life consciousness or supraconsciousness is the name for the rocket whose extinguished fragments fall back as matter consciousness again is the name for that which subsists of the rocket itself passing through the fragments and lighting them up into organisms but this consciousness which is a need of creation is made manifest to itself only where creation is possible it lies dormant when life is condemned to automatism it wakens as soon as the possibility of a choice is restored that is why in organisms unprovided with a nervous system it varies according to the power of locomotion and of deformation of which the organism disposes and in animals with a nervous system it is proportional to the complexity of the switchboard on which the paths called sensory and the paths called motor intersect that is of the brain how must this solidarity between the organism and consciousness be understood we will not dwell here on a point that we have dealt with in former works let us merely recall that a theory such as that according to which consciousness is attached to certain neurons and is thrown off from their work like a phosphorescence may be accepted by the scientist for the detail of analysis it is a convenient mode of expression but it is nothing else in reality a living being is a center of action it represents a certain sum of contingency entering into the world that is to say a certain quantity of possible action a quantity variable with individuals and especially with species the nervous system of an animal marks out the flexible lines on which its action will run although the potential energy is accumulated in the muscles rather than in the nervous system itself 
its nervous centres indicate, by their development and their configuration, the more or less extended choice it will have among more or less numerous and complicated actions. Now, since the awakening of consciousness in a living creature is the more complete, the greater the latitude of choice allowed to it, and the larger the amount of action bestowed upon it, it is clear that the development of consciousness will appear to be dependent on that of the nervous centres. On the other hand, every state of consciousness being, in one aspect of it, a question put to the motor activity and even the beginning of a reply, there is no psychical event that does not imply the entry into play of the cortical mechanisms. Everything seems, therefore, to happen as if consciousness sprang from the brain, and as if the detail of conscious activity were modelled on that of the cerebral activity. In reality, consciousness does not spring from the brain, but brain and consciousness correspond because equally they measure, the one by the complexity of its structure and the other by the intensity of its awareness, the quantity of choice that the living being has at its disposal. It is precisely because a cerebral state expresses simply what there is of nascent action in the corresponding psychical state that the psychical state tells us more than the cerebral state. The consciousness of a living being, as we have tried to prove elsewhere, is inseparable from its brain in the sense in which a sharp knife is inseparable from its edge. The brain is the sharp edge by which consciousness cuts into the compact tissue of events, but the brain is no more coextensive with consciousness than the edge is with the knife. Thus, from the fact that two brains, like that of the ape and that of the man, are very much alike, we cannot conclude that the corresponding consciousnesses are comparable or commensurable. But the two brains may perhaps be less alike than we suppose. How can we help being struck by the fact that, while man is capable of learning any sort of exercise, of constructing any sort of object, in short of acquiring any kind of motor habit whatsoever, the faculty of combining new movements is strictly limited in the best endowed animal, even in the ape. The cerebral characteristic of man is there. The human brain is made, like every brain, to set up motor mechanisms and to enable us to choose among them, at any instant, the one we shall put in motion by the pull of a trigger. But it differs from other brains in this, that the number of mechanisms it can set up, and consequently the choice that it gives as to which among them shall be released, is unlimited. Now, from the limited to the unlimited, there is all the distance between the closed and the open. It is not a difference of degree, but of kind. Radical, therefore, also, is the difference between animal consciousness, even the most intelligent, and human consciousness. For consciousness corresponds exactly to the living being's power of choice. It is coextensive with the fringe of possible action that surrounds the real action. Consciousness is synonymous with invention and with freedom. Now, in the animal, invention is never anything but a variation on the theme of routine. Shut up in the habits of the species, it succeeds, no doubt, in enlarging them by its individual initiative. But it escapes automatism only for an instant, for just the time to create a new automatism. The gates of its prison close as soon as they are opened. By pulling at its chain, it succeeds only in stretching it. With man, consciousness breaks the chain. In man, and in man alone, it sets itself free. The whole history of life until man has been that of the effort of consciousness to raise matter, and of the more or less complete overwhelming of consciousness by the matter which has fallen back on it. The enterprise was paradoxical if, indeed, we may speak here otherwise than by metaphor of enterprise and of effort. It was to create with matter, which is necessity itself, an instrument of freedom, to make a machine which should triumph over mechanism, and to use the determinism of nature to pass through the meshes of the net which this very determinism had spread. But everywhere except in man, consciousness has let itself be caught in the net whose meshes it tried to pass through. It has remained the captive of the mechanisms it has set up. Automatism, which it tries to draw in the direction of freedom, winds about it and drags it down. It has not the power to escape because the energy it has provided for acts is almost all employed in maintaining the infinitely subtle and essentially unstable equilibrium into which it has brought matter. But man not only maintains his machine, he succeeds in using it as he pleases. Doubtless he owes this to the superiority of his brain, which enables him to build an unlimited number of motor mechanisms, to oppose new habits to the old ones unceasingly, and by dividing automatism against itself, to rule it. He owes it to his language, which furnishes consciousness with an immaterial body in which to incarnate itself, and thus exempts it from dwelling exclusively on material bodies, whose flux would soon drag it along and finally swallow it up. He owes it to social life, 
which stores and preserves efforts as language stores thoughts, fixes thereby a mean level to which individuals must raise themselves at the outset, and by this initial stimulation prevents the average man from slumbering and drives the superior man to mount still higher. But our brain, our society and our language are only the external and various signs of one and the same internal superiority. They tell, each after its manner, the unique, exceptional success which life has won at a given moment of its evolution. They express the difference of kind, and not only of degree, which separates man from the rest of the animal world. They let us guess that, while at the end of the vast springboard from which life has taken its leap, all the others have stepped down, finding the cord stretched too high, man alone has cleared the obstacle. It is in this quite special sense that man is the term and the end of evolution. Life, we have said, transcends finality as it transcends the other categories. It is essentially a current sent through matter, drawing from it what it can. There has not, therefore, properly speaking, been any project or plan. On the other hand, it is abundantly evident that the rest of nature is not for the sake of man. We struggle like the other species, we have struggled against other species. Moreover, if the evolution of life had encountered other accidents in its course, if thereby the current of life had been otherwise divided, we should have been, physically and morally, far different from what we are. For these various reasons it would be wrong to regard humanity, such as we have it before our eyes, as prefigured in the evolutionary movement. It cannot even be said to be the outcome of the whole of evolution, for evolution has been accomplished on several divergent lines, and while the human species is at the end of one of them, other lines have been followed with other species at their end. It is in a quite different sense that we hold humanity to be the ground of evolution. From our point of view, life appears in its entirety as an immense wave which, starting from a centre, spreads outwards, and which on almost the whole of its circumference is stopped and converted into oscillation. At one single point the obstacle has been forced, the impulsion has passed freely. It is this freedom that the human form registers. Everywhere but in man, consciousness has had to come to a stand. In man alone it is kept on its way. Man then continues the vital movement indefinitely, although he does not draw along with him all that life carries in itself. On other lines of evolution there have travelled other tendencies which life implied, and of which, since everything interpenetrates, man has doubtless kept something, but of which he has kept only very little. It is as if a vague and formless being, whom we may call, as we will, man or superman, had sought to realise himself, and had succeeded only by abandoning a part of himself on the way. The losses are represented by the rest of the animal world, and even by the vegetable world, at least in what these have that is positive and above the accidents of evolution. From this point of view, the discordances of which nature offers us the spectacle are singularly weakened. The organized world as a whole becomes as the soil on which was to grow either man himself or a being who morally must resemble him. The animals, however distant they may be from our species, however hostile to it, have nonetheless been useful travelling companions, on whom consciousness has unloaded whatever encumbrances it was dragging along, and who have enabled it to rise, in man, to heights from which it sees an unlimited horizon open again before it. It is true that it has not only abandoned cumbersome baggage on the way, it has also had to give up valuable goods. Consciousness, in man, is preeminently intellect. It might have been, it ought, so it seems, to have been also intuition. Intuition and intellect represent two opposite directions of the work of consciousness. Intuition goes in the very direction of life, intellect goes in the inverse direction, and thus finds itself naturally in accordance with the movement of matter. A complete and perfect humanity would be that in which these two forms of conscious activity should attain their full development. And between this humanity and ours, we may conceive any number of possible stages, corresponding to all the degrees imaginable of intelligence and of intuition. In this lies the part of contingency in the mental structure of our species. A different evolution might have led to a humanity either more intellectual still or more intuitive. In the humanity of which we are a part, intuition is, in fact, almost completely sacrificed to intellect. It seems that to conquer matter and to reconquer its own self, consciousness has had to exhaust the best part of its power. This conquest, in the particular conditions in which it has been accomplished, has required that consciousness should adapt itself to the habits of matter and concentrate all its attention on them, in fact determine itself more especially as intellect. Intuition is there, however, but vague and above all discontinuous. 
it is a lamp almost extinguished which only glimmers now and then for a few moments at most but it glimmers wherever a vital interest is at stake on our personality on our liberty on the place we occupy in the whole of nature on our origin and perhaps also on our destiny it throws a light feeble and vacillating but which none the less pierces the darkness of the night in which the intellect leaves us these fleeting intuitions which light up their object only at distant intervals philosophy ought to seize first to sustain them then to expand them and so unite them together the more it advances in this work the more will it perceive that intuition is mind itself and in a certain sense life itself the intellect has been cut out of it by a process resembling that which has generated matter thus is revealed the unity of the spiritual life we recognize it only when we place ourselves in intuition in order to go from intuition to the intellect for from the intellect we shall never pass to intuition philosophy introduces us thus into the spiritual life and it shows us at the same time the relation of the life of the spirit to that of the body the great error of the doctrines on the spirit has been the idea that by isolating the spiritual life from all the rest by suspending it in space as high as possible above the earth they were placing it beyond attack as if they were not thereby simply exposing it to be taken as an effect of mirage certainly they are right to listen to conscience when conscience affirms human freedom but the intellect is there which says that the cause determines its effect that like conditions like that all is repeated and that all is given they are right to believe in the absolute reality of the person and in his independence toward matter but science is there which shows the interdependence of conscious life and cerebral activity they are right to attribute to man a privileged place in nature to hold that the distance is infinite between the animal and man but the history of life is there which makes us witness the genesis of species by gradual transformation and seems thus to reintegrate man in animality when a strong instinct assures the probability of personal survival they are right not to close their ears to its voice but if there exist souls capable of an independent life whence do they come when how and why do they enter into this body which we see arise quite naturally from a mixed cell derived from the bodies of its two parents all these questions will remain unanswered a philosophy of intuition will be a negation of science will be sooner or later swept away by science if it does not resolve to see the life of the body just where it really is on the road that leads to the life of the spirit but it will then no longer have to do with definite living beings life as a whole from the initial impulsion that thrust it into the world will appear as a wave which rises and which is opposed by the descending movement of matter on the greater part of its surface at different heights the current is converted by matter into a vortex at one point alone it passes freely dragging with it the obstacle which will weigh on its progress but will not stop it at this point is humanity it is our privileged situation on the other hand this rising wave is consciousness and like all consciousness it includes potentialities without number which interpenetrate and to which consequently neither the category of unity nor that of multiplicity is appropriate made as they both are for inert matter the matter that it bears along with it and in the interstices of which it inserts itself alone can divide it into distinct individualities on flows the current running through human generations subdividing itself into individuals this subdivision was vaguely indicated in it but could not have been made clear without matter thus souls are continually being created which nevertheless in a certain sense pre-existed they are nothing else than the little rills into which the great river of life divides itself flowing through the body of humanity the movement of the stream is distinct from the river bed although it must adopt its winding course consciousness is distinct from the organism it animates although it must undergo its vicissitudes as the possible actions which a state of consciousness indicates are at every instant beginning to be carried out in the nervous centres the brain underlines at every instant the motor indications of the state of consciousness but the interdependency of consciousness and brain is limited to this the destiny of consciousness is not bound up on that account with the destiny of cerebral matter finally consciousness is essentially free it is freedom itself but it cannot pass through matter without settling on it without adapting itself to it this adaptation is what we call intellectuality and the intellect turning itself back toward active that is to say free consciousness naturally makes it enter into the conceptual forms into which it is accustomed to see matter fit it will therefore always perceive freedom in the form of necessity 
it will always neglect the part of novelty or of creation inherent in the free act it will always substitute for action itself an imitation artificial approximative obtained by compounding the old with the old and the same with the same thus to the eyes of a philosophy that attempts to reabsorb intellect in intuition many difficulties vanish or become light but such a doctrine does not only facilitate speculation it gives us also more power to act and to live for with it we feel ourselves no longer isolated in humanity humanity no longer seems isolated in the nature that it dominates as the smallest grain of dust is bound up with our entire solar system drawn along with it in that undivided movement of descent which is materiality itself so all organized beings from the humblest to the highest from the first origins of life to the time in which we are and in all places as in all times do but evidence a single impulsion the inverse of the movement of matter and in itself indivisible all the living hold together and all yield to the same tremendous push the animal takes its stand on the plant man bestrides animality and the whole of humanity in space and in time is one immense army galloping beside and before and behind each of us in an overwhelming charge able to beat down every resistance and clear the most formidable obstacles perhaps even death end of chapter three end of section fourteen Section 15 of Evolution Creatrice by Henri Bergson, translated by Arthur Mitchell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4. The Cinematographical Mechanism of Thought and the Mechanistic Illusion. A Glance at the History of Systems. Real Becoming and False Evolutionism. Part 1. It remains for us to examine in themselves two theoretical illusions which we have frequently met with before, but whose consequences rather than principle have hitherto concerned us. Such is the object of the present chapter. It will afford us the opportunity of removing certain objections, of clearing up certain misunderstandings, and above all, of defining more precisely, by contrasting it with others, a philosophy which sees in duration the very stuff of reality matter or mind reality has appeared to us as a perpetual becoming it makes itself or it unmakes itself but it is never something made such is the intuition that we have of mind when we draw aside the veil which is interposed between our consciousness and ourselves this also is what our intellect and senses themselves would show us of matter if they could obtain a direct and disinterested idea of it but preoccupied before everything with the necessities of action the intellect like the senses is limited to taking at intervals views that are instantaneous and by that very fact immobile of the becoming of matter consciousness being in its turn formed on the intellect sees clearly of the inner life what is already made and only feels confusedly the making thus we pluck out of duration those moments that interest us and that we have gathered along its course these alone we retain and we are right in so doing while action only is in question but when in speculating on the nature of the real we go on regarding it as our practical interest requires us to regard it we become unable to perceive the true evolution the radical becoming of becoming we perceive only states of duration only instants and even when we speak of duration and of becoming it is of another thing that we are thinking such is the most striking of the two illusions we wish to examine it consists in supposing that we can think the unstable by means of the stable the moving by means of the immobile the other illusion is near akin to the first it has the same origin being also due to the fact that we import into speculation a procedure made for practice all action aims at getting something that we feel the want of or at creating something that does not yet exist in this very special sense it fills a void and goes from the empty to the full from an absence to a presence from the unreal to the real now the unreality which is here in question is purely relative to the direction in which our attention is engaged for we are immersed in realities and cannot pass out of them only if the present reality is not the one we are seeking we speak of the absence of this sought-for reality wherever we find the presence of another we thus express what we have as a function of what we want this is quite legitimate in the sphere of action but whether we will or no we keep to this way of speaking and also of thinking when we speculate on the nature of things independently of the interest they have for us thus arises the second of the two illusions we propose to examine this first 
it is due like the other to the static habits that our intellect contracts when it prepares our action on things just as we pass through the immobile to go to the moving so we make use of the void in order to think the full we have met with this illusion already in dealing with the fundamental problem of knowledge the question we then said is to know why there is order and not disorder in things but the question has meaning only if we suppose that disorder understood as an absence of order is possible or imaginable or conceivable now it is only order that is real but as order can take two forms and as the presence of the one may be said to consist in the absence of the other we speak of disorder whenever we have before us that one of the two orders for which we are not looking the idea of disorder is then entirely practical it corresponds to the disappointment of a certain expectation and it does not denote the absence of all order but only the presence of that order which does not offer us actual interest so that whenever we try to deny order completely absolutely we find that we are leaping from one kind of order to the other indefinitely and that the supposed suppression of the one and the other implies the presence of the two indeed if we go on and persist in shutting our eyes to this movement of the mind and all it involves we are no longer dealing with an idea all that is left of disorder is a word thus the problem of knowledge is complicated and possibly made insoluble by the idea that order fills a void and that its actual presence is superposed on its virtual absence we go from absence to presence from the void to the full in virtue of the fundamental illusion of our understanding that is the error of which we noticed one consequence in our last chapter as we then anticipated we must come to close quarters with this error and finally grapple with it we must face it in itself in the radically false conception which it implies of negation of the void and of the naught philosophers have paid little attention to the idea of the naught and yet it is often the hidden spring the invisible mover of philosophical thinking from the first awakening of reflection it is this that pushes to the fore right under the eyes of consciousness the torturing problems the questions that we cannot gaze at without feeling giddy and bewildered i have no sooner commenced to philosophize than i ask myself why i exist and when i take account of the intimate connection in which i stand to the rest of the universe the difficulty is only pushed back for i want to know why the universe exists and if i refer the universe to a principle immanent or transcendent that supports it or creates it my thought rests on this principle only a few moments for the same problem recurs this time in its full breadth and generality whence comes it and how can it be understood that anything exists even here in the present work when matter has been defined as a kind of descent this descent as the interruption of a rise this rise itself as a growth when finally a principle of creation has been put at the base of things the same question springs up how why does this principle exist rather than nothing now if i push these questions aside and go straight to what hides behind them this is what i find existence appears to me like a conquest over naught i say to myself that there might be that indeed there ought to be nothing and i then wonder that there is something or i represent all reality extended on nothing as on a carpet at first was nothing and being has come by superaddition to it or yet again if something has always existed nothing must always have served as its substratum or receptacle and is therefore eternally prior a glass may have always been full but the liquid it contains nevertheless fills a void in the same way being may have always been there but the naught which is filled and as it were stopped up by it pre-exists for it none the less if not in fact at least in right in short i cannot get rid of the idea that the full is an embroidery on the canvas of the void that being is superimposed on nothing and that in the idea of nothing there is less than in that of something hence all the mystery it is necessary that this mystery should be cleared up it is more especially necessary if we put duration and free choice at the base of things for the disdain of metaphysics for all reality that endures comes precisely from this that it reaches being only by passing through not being and that an existence which endures seems to it not strong enough to conquer non-existence and itself posit itself it is for this reason especially that it is inclined to endow true being with a logical and not a psychological nor a physical existence for the nature of a purely logical existence is such that it seems to be self-sufficient and to posit itself by the effect alone of the force immanent in truth if i ask myself why bodies or minds exist rather than nothing i find no answer but that a logical principle such as a equals a should have the power of creating itself triumphing over the naught throughout eternity seems to me natural 
a circle drawn with chalk on a blackboard is a thing which needs explanation this entirely physical existence has not by itself wherewith to vanquish non-existence but the logical essence of the circle that is to say the possibility of drawing it according to a certain law in short its definition is a thing which appears to me eternal it has neither place nor date for nowhere at no moment has the drawing of a circle begun to be possible suppose then that the principle on which all things rest and which all things manifest possesses an existence of the same nature as that of the definition of the circle or as that of the axiom a equals a the mystery of existence vanishes for the being that is at the base of everything posits itself then in eternity as logic itself does true it will cost us rather a heavy sacrifice if the principle of all things exists after the manner of a logical axiom or of a mathematical definition, the things themselves must go forth from this principle like the applications of an axiom or the consequences of a definition, and there will no longer be place, either in the things nor in their principle, for efficient causality understood in the sense of a free choice. Such are precisely the conclusions of a doctrine like that of Spinoza, or even that of Leibniz, and such indeed has been their genesis now if we could prove that the idea of the nought in the sense in which we take it when we oppose it to that of existence is a pseudo idea the problems that are raised around it would become pseudo problems the hypothesis of an absolute that acts freely that in an eminent sense endures would no longer raise up intellectual prejudices the road would be cleared for a philosophy more nearly approaching intuition and which would no longer ask the same sacrifices of common sense let us then see what we are thinking about when we speak of nothing. To represent nothing, we must either imagine it or conceive it. Let us examine what this image or this idea may be. First, the image. I am going to close my eyes, stop my ears, extinguish one by one the sensations that come to me from the outer world. Now it is done. All my perceptions vanish. The material universe sinks into silence and the night. I subsist, however, and cannot help myself subsisting. I am still there with the organic sensations which come to me from the surface and from the interior of my body, with the recollections which my past perceptions have left behind them, nay, with the impression most positive and full of the void I have just made about me. How can I suppress all this? How eliminate myself? I can even, it may be, blot out and forget my recollections up to my immediate past, but at least i keep the consciousness of my present reduced to its extremest poverty that is to say of the actual state of my body i will try however to do away even with this consciousness itself i will reduce more and more the sensations my body sends into me now they are almost gone now they are gone they have disappeared in the night where all things else have already died away but no at the very instant that my consciousness is extinguished another consciousness lights up or rather it was already a light it had arisen the instant before in order to witness the extinction of the first for the first could disappear only for another and in the presence of another i see myself annihilated only if i have already resuscitated myself by an act which is positive however involuntary and unconscious so do what i will i am always perceiving something either from without or from within when I no longer know anything of external objects, it is because I have taken refuge in the consciousness that I have of myself. If I abolish this inner self, its very abolition becomes an object for an imaginary self which now perceives as an external object the self that is dying away. Be it external or internal, some object there always is that my imagination is representing. My imagination, it is true, can go from one to the other. I can by turns imagine a naught of external perception or a naught of internal perception, but not both at once, for the absence of one consists at bottom in the exclusive presence of the other. But from the fact that two relative noughts are imaginable in turn, we wrongly conclude that they are imaginable together, a conclusion the absurdity of which must be obvious, for we cannot imagine a naught without perceiving, at least confusedly, that we are imagining it, consequently that we are acting that we are thinking and therefore that something still subsists the image then properly so called of a suppression of everything is never formed by thought the effort by which we strive to create this image simply ends in making a swing to and fro between the vision of an outer and that of an inner reality in this coming and going of our mind between the without and the within there is a point at equal distance from both in which it seems to us that we no longer perceive the one and that we do not yet perceive the other it is there that the image of nothing is formed in reality we then perceive both 
having reached the point where the two terms come together and the image of nothing so defined is an image full of things an image that includes at once that of the subject and that of the object and besides a perpetual leaping from one to the other and the refusal ever to come to rest finally on either evidently this is not the nothing that we can oppose to being and put before or beneath being for it already includes existence in general but we shall be told that if the representation of nothing visible or latent enters into the reasonings of philosophers it is not as an image but as an idea it may be agreed that we do not imagine the annihilation of everything but it will be claimed that we can conceive it we conceive a polygon with a thousand sides said descartes although we do not see it in imagination it is enough that we can clearly represent the possibility of constructing it so with the idea of the annihilation of everything nothing simpler it will be said than the procedure by which we construct the idea of it there is in fact not a single object of our experience that we cannot suppose annihilated extend this annihilation of a first object to a second then to a third and so on as long as you please the naught is the limit towards which the operation tends and the naught so defined is the annihilation of everything that is the theory we need only consider it in this form to see the absurdity it involves an idea constructed by the mind is an idea only if its pieces are capable of coexisting it is reduced to a mere word if the elements that we bring together to compose it are driven away as fast as we assemble them when i have defined the circle i easily represent a black or a white circle a circle in cardboard iron or brass a transparent or an opaque circle but not a square circle because the law of the generation of the circle excludes the possibility of defining this figure with straight lines so my mind can represent any existing thing whatever as annihilated but if the annihilation of anything by the mind is an operation whose mechanism implies that it works on a part of the whole and not on the whole itself then the extension of such an operation to the totality of things becomes self-contradictory and absurd and the idea of an annihilation of everything presents the same character as that of a square circle it is not an idea it is only a word so let us examine more closely the mechanism of the operation in fact the object suppressed is either external or internal it is a thing or it is a state of consciousness let us consider the first case i annihilate in thought an external object in the place where it was there is no longer anything no longer anything of that object of course but another object has taken its place there is no absolute void in nature but admit that an absolute void is possible it is not of that void that i am thinking when i say that the object once annihilated leaves its place unoccupied for by the hypothesis it is a place that is a void limited by precise outlines or in other words a kind of thing the void of which i speak therefore is at bottom only the absence of some definite object which was here at first is now elsewhere and in so far as it is no longer in its former place leaves behind it so to speak the void of itself a being unendowed with memory or prevision would not use the words void or naught he would express only what is and what is perceived now what is and what is perceived is the presence of one thing or of another never the absence of anything there is absence only for a being capable of remembering and expecting he remembered an object and perhaps expected to encounter it again he finds another and he expresses the disappointment of his expectation an expectation sprung from recollection by saying that he no longer finds anything that he encounters nothing even if he did not expect to encounter the object it is a possible expectation of it it is still the falsification of his eventual expectation that he expresses by saying that the object is no longer where it was what he perceives in reality what he will succeed in effectively thinking of is the presence of the old object in a new place or that of a new object in the old place the rest all that is expressed negatively by such words as naught or the void is not so much thought as feeling or to speak more exactly it is the tinge that feeling gives to thought the idea of annihilation or of partial nothingness is therefore formed here in the course of the substitution of one thing for another whenever this substitution is thought by a mind that would prefer to keep the old thing in the place of the new or at least conceives this preference as possible the idea implies on the subjective side a preference on the objective side a substitution and is nothing else but a combination of or rather an interference between this feeling of preference and this idea of substitution such is the mechanism of the operation by which our mind annihilates an object and succeeds in representing in the external world a partial naught 
Let us now see how it represents it within itself. We find in ourselves phenomena that are produced and not phenomena that are not produced. I experience a sensation or an emotion, I conceive an idea, I form a resolution. My consciousness perceives these facts, which are so many presences, and there is no moment in which facts of this kind are not present to me. I can no doubt interrupt by thought the course of my inner life. I may suppose that I sleep without dreaming or that I have ceased to exist. But at the very instant when I make this supposition, I conceive myself, I imagine myself watching over my slumber or surviving my annihilation, and I give up perceiving myself from within only by taking refuge in the perception of myself from without. That is to say that here again the full always succeeds the full, and that an intelligence that was only intelligence, that had neither regret nor desire, whose movement was governed by the movement of its object, could not even conceive an absence or a void. The conception of a void arises here when consciousness, lagging behind itself, remains attached to the recollection of an old state when another state is already present. It is only a comparison between what is and what could or ought to be, between the full and the full. In a word, whether it be a void of matter or a void of consciousness, the representation of the void is always a representation which is full and which resolves itself on analysis into two positive elements, the idea, distinct or confused, of a substitution, and the feeling, experienced or imagined, of a desire or a regret. It follows from this double analysis that the idea of the absolute naught, in the sense of the annihilation of everything, is a self-destructive idea, a pseudo-idea, a mere word. If suppressing a thing consists in replacing it by another, if thinking the absence of one thing is only possible by the more or less explicit representation of the presence of some other thing, if, in short, annihilation signifies before anything else substitution, the idea of an annihilation of everything is as absurd as that of a square circle. The absurdity is not obvious because there exists no particular object that cannot be supposed annihilated. Then, from the fact that there is nothing to prevent each thing in turn being suppressed in thought, we conclude that it is possible to suppose them suppressed altogether. We do not see that suppressing each thing in turn consists precisely in replacing it in proportion and degree by another, and therefore that the suppression of absolutely everything implies a downright contradiction in terms, since the operation consists in destroying the very condition that makes the operation possible. But the illusion is tenacious. Though suppressing one thing consists in fact in substituting another for it, we do not conclude, we are unwilling to conclude, that the annihilation of a thing in thought implies the substitution in thought of a new thing for the old. We agree that a thing is always replaced by another thing, and even that our mind cannot think the disappearance of an object, external or internal, without thinking, under an indeterminate and confused form it is true, that another object is substituted for it. But we add that the representation of a disappearance is that of a phenomenon that is produced in space or at least in time, that consequently it still implies the calling up of an image, and that it is precisely here that we have to free ourselves from the imagination in order to appeal to the pure understanding. Let us therefore no longer speak, it will be said, of disappearance or annihilation. These are physical operations. Let us no longer represent the object A as annihilated or absent. Let us say simply that we think it non-existent. To annihilate it is to act on it in time and perhaps also in space. It is to accept, consequently, the condition of spatial and temporal existence, to accept the universal connection that binds an object to all others and prevents it from disappearing without being at the same time replaced. But we can free ourselves from these conditions. All that is necessary is that by an effort of abstraction we should call up the idea of the object A by itself, that we should agree first to consider it as existing, and then, by a stroke of the intellectual pen, blot out the clause. The object will then be, by our decree, non-existent. Very well, let us strike out the clause. We must not suppose that our pen stroke is self-sufficient, that it can be isolated from the rest of things. We shall see that it carries with it, whether we will or no, all that we try to abstract from. Let us compare together the two ideas, the object A supposed to exist, and the same object supposed non-existent. The idea of the object A, supposed existent, is the representation pure and simple of the object A, for we cannot represent an object without attributing to it, by the very fact of representing it, a certain reality. Between thinking an object and thinking it existent, there is absolutely no difference. Kant has put this point in clear light in his criticism of the ontological argument. 
then what is it to think the object a non-existent to represent it non-existent cannot consist in withdrawing from the idea of the object a the idea of the attribute existence since i repeat the representation of the existence of the object is inseparable from the representation of the object and indeed is one with it to represent the object a non-existent can only consist therefore in adding something to the idea of this object we add to it in fact the idea of an exclusion of this particular object by actual reality in general to think the object a as non-existent is first to think the object and consequently to think it existent it is then to think that another reality with which it is incompatible supplants it only it is useless to represent this latter reality explicitly we are not concerned with what it is it is enough for us to know that it drives out the object a which alone is of interest to us that is why we think of the expulsion rather than of the cause which expels but this cause is none the less present to the mind it is there in the implicit state that which expels being inseparable from the expulsion as the hand which drives the pen is inseparable from the pen stroke the act by which we declare an object unreal therefore posits the existence of the real in general in other words to represent an object as unreal cannot consist in depriving it of every kind of existence since the representation of an object is necessarily that of the object existing such an act consists simply in declaring that the existence attached by our mind to the object and inseparable from its representation is an existence wholly ideal that of a mere possible but the ideality of an object and the simple possibility of an object have meaning only in relation to a reality that drives into the region of the ideal or of the merely possible the object which is incompatible with it suppose the stronger and more substantial existence annihilated it is the attenuated and weaker existence of the merely possible that becomes the reality itself and you will no longer be representing the object then as non-existent in other words and however strange our assertion may seem there is more and not less in the idea of an object conceived as not existing than in the idea of this same object conceived as existing for the idea of the object not existing is necessarily the idea of the object existing with in addition the representation of an exclusion of this object by the actual reality taken in block but it will be claimed that our idea of the non-existent is not yet sufficiently cut loose from every imaginative element that it is not negative enough no matter we shall be told though the unreality of a thing consist in its exclusion by other things we want to know nothing about that are we not free to direct our attention where we please and how we please well then after having called up the idea of an object and thereby if you will have it so supposed it existent we shall merely couple to our affirmation a not and that will be enough to make us think it non-existent this is an operation entirely intellectual independent of what happens outside the mind so let us think of anything or let us think of the totality of things and then write in the margin of our thought the not which prescribes the rejection of what it contains we annihilate everything mentally by the mere fact of decreeing its annihilation here we have it the very root of all the difficulties and errors with which we are confronted is to be found in the power ascribed here to negation we represent negation as exactly symmetrical with affirmation we imagine that negation like affirmation is self-sufficient so that negation like affirmation would have the power of creating ideas with this sole difference that they would be negative ideas by affirming one thing and then another and so on ad infinitum i form the idea of all so by denying one thing and then other things finally by denying all i arrive at the idea of nothing but it is just this assimilation which is arbitrary we fail to see that while affirmation is a complete act of the mind which can succeed in building up an idea negation is but the half of an intellectual act of which the other half is understood or rather put off to an indefinite future we fail to see that while affirmation is a purely intellectual act there enters into negation an element which is not intellectual and that it is precisely to the intrusion of this foreign element that negation owes its specific character to begin with the second point let us note that to deny always consists in setting aside a possible affirmation negation is only an attitude taken by the mind toward an eventual affirmation when i say this table is black i am speaking of the table i have seen it black and my judgment expresses what i have seen but if i say this table is not white i surely do not express something i have perceived for i have seen black and not an absence of white 
it is therefore at bottom not on the table itself that i bring this judgment to bear but rather on the judgment that would declare the table white i judge a judgment and not the table the proposition this table is not white implies that you might believe it white that you did believe it such or that i was going to believe it such i warn you or myself that this judgment is to be replaced by another which it is true i leave undetermined thus while affirmation bears directly on the thing negation aims at the thing only indirectly through an interposed affirmation an affirmative proposition expresses a judgment on an object a negative proposition expresses a judgment on a judgment negation therefore differs from affirmation properly so called in that it is an affirmation of the second degree it affirms something of an affirmation which itself affirms something of an object but it follows at once from this that negation is not the work of pure mind i should say of a mind placed before objects and concerned with them alone when we deny we give a lesson to others or it may be to ourselves we take to task an interlocutor real or possible whom we find mistaken and whom we put on his guard he was affirming something we tell him he ought to affirm something else though without specifying the affirmation which must be substituted there is no longer then simply a person and an object there is in face of the object a person speaking to a person opposing him and aiding him at the same time there is a beginning of society negation aims at some one and not only like a purely intellectual operation at some thing it is of a pedagogical and social nature it sets straight or rather warns the person warned and sets straight being possibly by a kind of doubling the very person that speaks so much for the second point now for the first we said that negation is but the half of an intellectual act of which the other half is left indeterminate if i pronounce the negative proposition this table is not white i mean that you ought to substitute for your judgment the table is white another judgment i give you an admonition and the admonition refers to the necessity of a substitution as to what you ought to substitute for your affirmation i tell you nothing it is true this may be because i do not know the color of the table but it is also it is indeed even more because the white color is that alone that interests us for the moment so that i only need to tell you that some other color will have to be substituted for white without having to say which a negative judgment is therefore really one which indicates a need of substituting for an affirmative judgment another affirmative judgment the nature of which however is not specified sometimes because it is not known more often because it fails to offer any actual interest the attention bearing only on the substance of the first thus whenever i add a not to an affirmation whenever i deny i perform two very definite acts one i interest myself in what one of my fellow-men affirms or in what he was going to say or in what might have been said by another me whom i anticipate two i announce that some other affirmation whose content i do not specify will have to be substituted for the one i find before me now in neither of these two acts is there anything but affirmation the sui generis character of negation is due to superimposing the first of these acts upon the second it is in vain then that we attribute to negation the power of creating ideas sui generis symmetrical with those that affirmation creates and directed in a contrary sense no idea will come forth from negation for it has no other content than that of the affirmative judgment which it judges to be more precise let us consider an existential instead of an attributive judgment if i say the object a does not exist i mean by that first that we might believe that the object a exists how indeed can we think of the object a without thinking it existing and once again what difference can there be between the idea of the object a existing and the idea pure and simple of the object a therefore merely by saying the object a i attribute to it some kind of existence though it be that of a mere possible that is to say of a pure idea and consequently in the judgment the object a is not there is at first an affirmation such as the object a has been or the object a will be or more generally the object a exists at least as a mere possible now when i add the two words is not i can only mean that if we go further if we erect the possible object into a real object we shall be mistaken and that the possible of which i am speaking is excluded from the actual reality as incompatible with it judgments that posit the non-existence of a thing are therefore judgments that formulate a contrast between the possible and the actual that is between two kinds of existence one thought and the other found 
where a person real or imaginary wrongly believes that a certain possible is realized instead of this possible there is a reality that differs from it and rejects it the negative judgment expresses this contrast but it expresses the contrast in an intentionally incomplete form because it is addressed to a person who is supposed to be interested exclusively in the possible that is indicated and is not concerned to know by what kind of reality the possible is replaced the expression of the substitution is therefore bound to be cut short instead of affirming that a second term is substituted for the first the attention which was originally directed to the first term will be kept fixed upon it and upon it alone and without going beyond the first we shall implicitly affirm that a second term replaces it in saying that the first is not we shall thus judge a judgment instead of judging a thing we shall warn others or warn ourselves of a possible error instead of supplying positive information suppress every intention of this kind give knowledge back its exclusively scientific or philosophical character suppose in other words that reality comes itself to inscribe itself on a mind that cares only for things and is not interested in persons we shall affirm that such or such a thing is we shall never affirm that a thing is not how comes it then that affirmation and negation are so persistently put on the same level and endowed with an equal objectivity how comes it that we have so much difficulty in recognizing that negation is subjective artificially cut short relative to the human mind and still more to the social life the reason is no doubt that both negation and affirmation are expressed in propositions and that any proposition being formed of words which symbolize concepts is something relative to social life and to the human intellect whether i say the ground is damp or the ground is not damp in both cases the terms ground and damp are concepts more or less artificially created by the mind of man extracted by his free initiative from the continuity of experience in both cases the concepts are represented by the same conventional words in both cases we can say indeed that the proposition aims at a social and pedagogical end since the first would propagate a truth as the second would prevent an error from this point of view which is that of formal logic to affirm and to deny are indeed two mutually symmetrical acts of which the first establishes a relation of agreement and the second a relation of disagreement between a subject and an attribute but how do we fail to see that the symmetry is altogether external and the likeness superficial suppose language fallen into disuse society dissolved every intellectual initiative every faculty of self-reflection and of self-judgment atrophied in man the dampness of the ground will subsist none the less capable of inscribing itself automatically in sensation and of sending a vague idea to the deadened intellect the intellect will still affirm in implicit terms and consequently neither distinct concepts nor words nor the desire of spreading the truth nor that of bettering oneself are of the very essence of the affirmation but this passive intelligence mechanically keeping step with experience neither anticipating nor following the course of the real would have no wish to deny it could not receive an imprint of negation for once again that which exists may come to be recorded but the non-existence of the non-existing cannot for such an intellect to reach the point of denying it must awake from its torpor formulate the disappointment of a real or possible expectation correct an actual or possible error in short propose to teach others or to teach itself it is rather difficult to perceive this in the example we have chosen but the example is indeed the more instructive and the argument the more cogent on that account if dampness is able automatically to come and record itself it is the same it will be said with non-dampness for the dry as well as the damp can give impressions to sense which will transmit them as more or less distinct ideas to the intelligence in this sense the negation of dampness is as objective a thing as purely intellectual as remote from every pedagogical intention as affirmation but let us look at it more closely we shall see that the negative proposition the ground is not damp and the affirmative proposition the ground is dry have entirely different contents the second implies that we know the dry that we have experienced the specific sensations tactile or visual for example that are at the base of this idea the first requires nothing of the sort it could equally well have been formulated by an intelligent fish who had never perceived anything but the wet it would be necessary it is true that this fish should have risen to the distinction between the real and the possible and that he should care to anticipate the error of his fellow fishes who doubtless consider as alone possible the condition of wetness in which they actually live keep strictly to the terms of the proposition the ground is not damp and you will find that it means two things one that one might believe the ground is damp two 
that the dampness is replaced in fact by a certain quality x this quality is left indeterminate either because we have no positive knowledge of it or because it has no actual interest for the person to whom the negation is addressed to deny therefore always consists in presenting in an abridged form a system of two affirmations the one determinate which applies to a certain possible the other indeterminate referring to the unknown or indifferent reality that supplants this possibility the second affirmation is virtually contained in the judgment we apply to the first a judgment which is negation itself and what gives negation its subjective character is precisely this that in the discovery of a replacement it takes account only of the replaced and is not concerned with what replaces the replaced exists only as a conception of the mind it is necessary in order to continue to see it and consequently in order to speak of it to turn our back on the reality which flows from the past to the present advancing from behind it is this that we do when we deny we discover the change or more generally the substitution as a traveller would see the course of his carriage if he looked out behind and only knew at each moment the point at which he had ceased to be he could never determine his actual position except by relation to that which he had just quitted instead of grasping it in itself to sum up for a mind which should follow purely and simply the thread of experience there would be no void no naught even relative or partial no possible negation such a mind would see facts succeed facts states succeed states things succeed things what it would note at each moment would be things existing states appearing events happening it would live in the actual and if it were capable of judging it would never affirm anything except the existence of the present endow this mind with memory and especially with the desire to dwell on the past give it the faculty of dissociating and of distinguishing it will no longer only note the present state of the passing reality it will represent the passing as a change and therefore as a contrast between what has been and what is and as there is no essential difference between a past that we remember and a past that we imagine it will quickly rise to the idea of the possible in general it will thus be shunted onto the siding of negation and especially it will be at the point of representing a disappearance but it will not yet have reached it to represent that a thing has disappeared it is not enough to perceive a contrast between the past and the present it is necessary besides to turn our back on the present to dwell on the past and to think the contrast of the past with the present in terms of the past only without letting the present appear in it the idea of annihilation is therefore not a pure idea it implies that we regret the past or that we conceive it as regrettable that we have some reason to linger over it the idea arises when the phenomenon of substitution is cut in two by a mind which considers only the first half because that alone interests it suppress all interest all feeling and there is nothing left but the reality that flows together with the knowledge ever renewed that it impresses on us of its present state from annihilation to negation which is a more general operation there is now only a step all that is necessary is to represent the contrast of what is not only with what has been but also with all that might have been and we must express this contrast as a function of what might have been and not of what is we must affirm the existence of the actual while looking only at the possible the formula we thus obtain no longer expresses merely a disappointment of the individual it is made to correct or guard against an error which is rather supposed to be the error of another in this sense negation has a pedagogical and social character now once negation is formulated it presents an aspect symmetrical with that of affirmation if affirmation affirms an objective reality it seems that negation must affirm a non-reality equally objective and so to say equally real in which we are both right and wrong wrong because negation cannot be objectified in so far as it is negative right however in that the negation of a thing implies the latent affirmation of its replacement by something else which we systematically leave on one side but the negative form of negation benefits by the affirmation at the bottom of it bestriding the positive solid reality to which it is attached this phantom objectifies itself thus is formed the idea of the void or of a partial naught a thing being supposed to be replaced not by another thing but by a void which it leaves that is by the negation of itself now as this operation works on anything whatever we suppose it performed on each thing in turn and finally on all things in block we thus obtain the idea of absolute nothing if now we analyze this idea of nothing we find that it is at bottom the idea of everything together with the movement of the mind that keeps jumping from one thing to another refuses to stand still 
and concentrates all its attention on this refusal by never determining its actual position except by relation to that which it has just left it is therefore an idea eminently comprehensive and full as full and comprehensive as the idea of all to which it is very closely akin how then can the idea of naught be opposed to that of all is it not plain that this is to oppose the full to the full and that the question why does something exist is consequently without meaning a pseudo problem raised about a pseudo idea yet we must say once more why this phantom of a problem haunts the mind with such obstinacy in vain do we show that in the idea of an annihilation of the real there is only the image of all realities expelling one another endlessly in a circle in vain do we add that the idea of non-existence is only that of the expulsion of an imponderable existence or a merely possible existence by a more substantial existence which would then be the true reality in vain do we find in the sui generis form of negation an element which is not intellectual negation being the judgment of a judgment an admonition given to someone else or to oneself so that it is absurd to attribute to negation the power of creating ideas of a new kind namely ideas without content in spite of all the conviction persists that before things or at least under things there is nothing if we seek the reason of this fact we shall find it precisely in the feeling in the social and so to speak practical element that gives its specific form to negation the greatest philosophic difficulties arise as we have said from the fact that the forms of human action venture outside of their proper sphere we are made in order to act as much as and more than in order to think or rather when we follow the bent of our nature it is in order to act that we think it is therefore no wonder that the habits of action give their tone to those of thought and that our mind always perceives things in the same order in which we are accustomed to picture them when we propose to act on them now it is unquestionable as we remarked above that every human action has its starting point in a dissatisfaction and thereby in a feeling of absence we should not act if we did not set before ourselves an end and we seek a thing only because we feel the lack of it our action proceeds thus from nothing to something and its very essence is to embroider something on the canvas of nothing the truth is that the nothing concerned here is the absence not so much of a thing as of a utility if i bring a visitor into a room that i have not yet furnished i say to him that there is nothing in it yet i know the room is full of air but as we do not sit on air the room truly contains nothing that at this moment for the visitor and for myself counts for anything in a general way human work consists in creating utility and as long as the work is not done there is nothing nothing that we want our life is thus spent in filling voids which our intellect conceives under the influence by no means intellectual of desire and of regret under the pressure of vital necessities and if we mean by void an absence of utility and not of things we may say in this quite relative sense that we are constantly going from the void to the full such is the direction which our action takes our speculation cannot help doing the same and naturally it passes from the relative sense to the absolute sense since it is exercised on things themselves and not on the utility they have for us thus is implanted in us the idea that reality fills a void and that nothing conceived as an absence of everything pre-exists before all things in right if not in fact it is this illusion that we have tried to remove by showing that the idea of nothing if we try to see in it that of an annihilation of all things is self-destructive and reduced to a mere word and that if on the contrary it is truly an idea then we find in it as much matter as in the idea of all end of section fifteen Section 16 of Evolution Creatrice by Henri Bergson, translated by Arthur Mitchell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, Part 2 This long analysis has been necessary to show that a self-sufficient reality is not necessarily a reality foreign to duration. If we pass, consciously or unconsciously, through the idea of the naught in order to reach that of being, the being to which we come is a logical or mathematical essence, therefore non-temporal and consequently a static conception of the real is forced on us everything appears given once for all in eternity but we must accustom ourselves to think being directly without making a detour without first appealing to the phantom of the naught which interposes itself between it and us we must strive to see in order to see and no longer to see in order to act 
then the absolute is revealed very near us and in a certain measure in us it is of psychological and not of mathematical nor logical essence it lives with us like us but in certain aspects infinitely more concentrated and more gathered up in itself it endures but do we ever think true duration here again a direct taking possession is necessary it is no use trying to approach duration we must install ourselves within it straight away this is what the intellect generally refuses to do accustomed as it is to think the moving by means of the unmovable the function of the intellect is to preside over actions now in action it is the result that interests us the means matter little provided the end is attained thence it comes that we are altogether bent on the end to be realized generally trusting ourselves to it in order that the idea may become an act and thence it comes also that only the goal where our activity will rest is pictured explicitly to our mind the movements constituting the action itself either elude our consciousness or reach it only confusedly let us consider a very simple act like that of lifting the arm where should we be if we had to imagine beforehand all the elementary contractions and tensions this act involves or even to perceive them one by one as they are accomplished but the mind is carried immediately to the end that is to say to the schematic and simplified vision of the act supposed accomplished then if no antagonistic idea neutralizes the effect of the first idea the appropriate movements come of themselves to fill out the plan drawn in some way by the void of its gaps the intellect then only represents to the activity ends to attain that is to say points of rest and from one end attained to another end attained from one rest to another rest our activity is carried by a series of leaps during which our consciousness is turned away as much as possible from the movement going on to regard only the anticipated image of the movement accomplished now in order that it may represent as unmovable the result of the act which is being accomplished the intellect must perceive as also unmovable the surroundings in which this result is being framed our activity is fitted into the material world if matter appeared to us as a perpetual flowing we should assign no termination to any of our actions we should feel each of them dissolve as fast as it was accomplished and we should not anticipate an ever fleeting future in order that our activity may leap from an act to an act it is necessary that matter should pass from a state to a state for it is only into a state of the material world that action can fit a result so as to be accomplished but is it thus that matter presents itself a priori we may presume that our perception manages to apprehend matter with this bias sensory organs and motor organs are in fact coordinated with each other now the first symbolize our faculty of perceiving as the second our faculty of acting the organism thus evidences in a visible and tangible form the perfect accord of perception and action so if our activity always aims at a result into which it is momentarily fitted our perception must retain of the material world at every moment only a state in which it is provisionally placed this is the most natural hypothesis and it is easy to see that experience confirms it from our first glance at the world before we even make our bodies in it we distinguish qualities color succeeds to color sound to sound resistance to resistance etc each of these qualities taken separately is a state that seems to persist as such immovable until another replaces it yet each of these qualities resolves itself on analysis into an enormous number of elementary movements whether we see it in vibrations or whether we represent it any other way one fact is certain it is that every quality is change in vain moreover shall we seek beneath the change the thing which changes it is always provisionally and in order to satisfy our imagination that we attach the movement to a mobile the mobile flies forever before the pursuit of science which is concerned with mobility alone in the smallest discernible fraction of a second in the almost instantaneous perception of a sensible quality there may be trillions of oscillations which repeat themselves the permanence of a sensible quality consists in this repetition of movements as the persistence of life consists in a series of palpitations the primal function of perception is precisely to grasp a series of elementary changes under the form of a quality or of a simple state by a work of condensation the greater the power of acting bestowed upon an animal species the more numerous probably are the elementary changes that its faculty of perceiving concentrates into one of its instants and the progress must be continuous in nature from the beings that vibrate almost in unison with the oscillations of the ether 
up to those that embrace trillions of these oscillations in the shortest of their simple perceptions. The first feel hardly anything but movements, the others perceive quality. The first are almost caught up in the running gear of things, the others react, and the tension of their faculty of acting is probably proportional to the concentration of their faculty of perceiving. The progress goes on even in humanity itself. A man is so much the more a man of action as he can embrace in a glance a greater number of events. He who perceives successive events one by one will allow himself to be led by them. He who grasps them as a whole will dominate them. In short, the qualities of matter are so many stable views that we take of its instability. Now, in the continuity of sensible qualities, we mark off the boundaries of bodies. Each of these bodies really changes at every moment. In the first place, it resolves itself into a group of qualities, and every quality, as we said, consists of a succession of elementary movements. But even if we regard the quality as a stable state, the body is still unstable in that it changes qualities without ceasing. The body preeminently, that which we are most justified in isolating within the continuity of matter, because it constitutes a relatively closed system, is the living body. It is, moreover, for it that we cut out the others within the whole. Now, life is an evolution. We concentrate a period of this evolution in a stable view which we call a form, and, when the change has become considerable enough to overcome the fortunate inertia of our perception, we say that the body has changed its form. But in reality the body is changing form at every moment, or rather there is no form, since form is immobile and the reality is movement. What is real is the continual change of form. Form is only a snapshot view of a transition. Therefore, here again, our perception manages to solidify into discontinuous images the fluid continuity of the real. When the successive images do not differ from each other too much, we consider them all as the waxing and waning of a single mean image, or as the deformation of this image in different directions. And to this mean we really allude when we speak of the essence of a thing, or of the thing itself. Finally, things, once constituted, show on the surface, by their changes of situation, the profound changes that are being accomplished within the whole. We say then that they act on one another. This action appears to us, no doubt, in the form of movement. But from the mobility of the movement we turn away as much as we can. What interests us is, as we said above, the unmovable plan of the movement rather than the movement itself. Is it a simple movement? We ask ourselves where it is going. It is by its direction, that is to say, by the position of its provisional end, that we represent it at every moment. Is it a complex movement? We would know, above all, what is going on, what the movement is doing. In other words, the result obtained or the presiding intention. Examine closely what is in your mind when you speak of an action in course of accomplishment. The idea of change is there, I am willing to grant, but it is hidden in the penumbra. In the full light is the motionless plan of the act supposed accomplished. It is by this, and by this only, that the complex act is distinguished and defined. We should be very much embarrassed if we had to imagine the movements inherent in the actions of eating, drinking, fighting, etc. It is enough for us to know, in a general and indefinite way, that all these acts are movements. Once that side of the matter has been settled, we simply seek to represent the general plan of each of these complex movements, that is to say the motionless design that underlies them. Here again knowledge bears on a state rather than on a change. It is therefore the same with this third case as with the others. Whether the movement be qualitative or evolutionary or extensive, the mind manages to take stable views of the instability. And thence the mind derives, as we have just shown, three kinds of representations. One, qualities. Two, forms of essences. 3. Acts. To these three ways of seeing correspond three categories of words, adjectives, substantives, and verbs, which are the primordial elements of language. Adjectives and substantives therefore symbolize states, but the verb itself, if we keep to the clear part of the idea it calls up, hardly expresses anything else. End of section 16. Section 17 of Evolution Créatrice by Henri Bergson, translated by Arthur Mitchell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, Part 3 Now, if we try to characterize more precisely our natural attitude towards becoming, this is what we find. Becoming is infinitely varied. That which goes from yellow to green is not like that which goes from green to blue. 
they are different qualitative movements that which goes from flower to fruit is not like that which goes from lava to nymph and from nymph to perfect insect they are different evolutionary movements the action of eating or of drinking is not like the action of fighting they are different extensive movements and these three kinds of movement themselves qualitative evolutionary extensive differ profoundly the trick of our perception like that of our intelligence like that of our language consists in extracting from these profoundly different becomings the single representation of becoming in general undefined becoming a mere abstraction which by itself says nothing and of which indeed it is very rarely that we think to this idea always the same and always obscure or unconscious we then join in each particular case one or several clear images that represent states and which serve to distinguish all becomings from each other it is this composition of a specified and definite state with change general and undefined that we substitute for the specific change an infinite multiplicity of becomings variously colored so to speak passes before our eyes we manage so that we see only differences of color that is to say differences of state beneath which there is supposed to flow hidden from our view a becoming always and everywhere the same invariably colorless suppose we wish to portray on a screen a living picture such as the marching past of a regiment there is one way in which it might first occur to us to do it that would be to cut out jointed figures representing the soldiers to give to each of them the movement of marching a movement varying from individual to individual although common to the human species and to throw the whole on the screen we should need to spend on this little game an enormous amount of work and even then we should obtain but a very poor result how could it at its best reproduce the suppleness and variety of life now there is another way of proceeding more easy and at the same time more effective it is to take a series of snapshots of the passing regiment and to throw these instantaneous views on the screen so that they replace each other very rapidly this is what the cinematograph does with photographs each of which represents the regiment in a fixed attitude it reconstitutes the mobility of the regiment marching it is true that if we had to do with photographs alone however much we might look at them we should never see them animated with immobility set beside immobility even endlessly we could never make movement in order that the pictures may be animated there must be movement somewhere the movement does indeed exist here it is in the apparatus it is because the film of the cinematograph unrolls bringing in turn the different photographs of the scene to continue each other that each actor of the scene recovers his mobility he strings all his successive attitudes on the invisible movement of the film the process then consists in extracting from all the movements peculiar to all the figures an impersonal movement abstract and simple movement in general so to speak we put this into the apparatus and we reconstitute the individuality of each particular movement by combining this nameless movement with the personal attitudes such is the contrivance of the cinematograph and such is also that of our knowledge instead of attaching ourselves to the inner becoming of things we place ourselves outside them in order to recompose their becoming artificially we take snapshots as it were of the passing reality and as these are characteristic of the reality we have only to string them on a becoming abstract uniform and invisible situated at the back of the apparatus of knowledge in order to imitate what there is that is characteristic in this becoming itself perception intellection language so proceed in general whether we would think becoming or express it or even perceive it we hardly do anything else than set going a kind of cinematograph inside us we may therefore sum up what we have been saying in the conclusion that the mechanism of our ordinary knowledge is of a cinematographical kind of the altogether practical character of this operation there is no possible doubt each of our acts aims at a certain insertion of our will into the reality there is between our body and other bodies an arrangement like that of the pieces of glass that compose a kaleidoscopic picture our activity goes from an arrangement to a rearrangement each time no doubt giving the kaleidoscope a new shake but not interesting itself in the shake and seeing only the new picture our knowledge of the operation of nature must be exactly symmetrical therefore with the interest we take in our own operation in this sense we say if we are not abusing this kind of illustration that the cinematographical character of our knowledge of things is due to the kaleidoscopic character of our adaptation to them the cinematographical method is therefore the only practical method since it consists in making the general character of knowledge form itself on that of action 
while expecting that the detail of each act should depend in its turn on that of knowledge in order that action may always be enlightened intelligence must always be present in it but intelligence in order thus to accompany the progress of activity and ensure its direction must begin by adopting its rhythm action is discontinuous like every pulsation of life discontinuous therefore is knowledge the mechanism of the faculty of knowing has been constructed on this plan essentially practical can it be of use such as it is for speculation let us try with it to follow reality in its windings and see what will happen i take of the continuity of a particular becoming a series of views which i connect together by becoming in general but of course i cannot stop there what is not determinable is not representable of becoming in general i have only a verbal knowledge as the letter x designates a certain unknown quantity whatever it may be so my becoming in general always the same symbolizes here a certain transition of which i have taken some snapshots of the transition itself it teaches me nothing let me then concentrate myself wholly on the transition and between any two snapshots endeavor to realize what is going on as i apply the same method i obtain the same result a third view merely slips in between the two others i may begin again as often as i will i may set views alongside of views forever i shall obtain nothing else the application of the cinematographical method therefore leads to a perpetual recommencement during which the mind never able to satisfy itself and never finding where to rest persuades itself no doubt that it imitates by its instability the very movement of the real but though by straining itself to the point of giddiness it may end by giving itself the illusion of mobility its operation has not advanced it a step since it remains as far as ever from its goal in order to advance with the moving reality you must replace yourself within it install yourself within change and you will grasp at once both change itself and the successive states in which it might at any instant be immobilized but with these successive states perceived from without as real and no longer as potential immobilities you will never reconstitute movement call them qualities forms positions or intentions as the case may be multiply the number of them as you will let the interval between two consecutive states be infinitely small before the intervening movement you will always experience the disappointment of the child who tries by clapping his hands together to crush the smoke the movement slips through the interval because every attempt to reconstitute change out of states implies the absurd proposition that movement is made of immobilities philosophy perceived this as soon as it opened its eyes the arguments of zeno of elea although formulated with a very different intention have no other meaning take the flying arrow at every moment says zeno it is motionless for it cannot have time to move that is to occupy at least two successive positions unless at least two moments are allowed it at a given moment therefore it is at rest at a given point motionless in each point of its course it is motionless during all the time that it is moving yes if we suppose that the arrow can ever be in a point of its course yes again if the arrow which is moving ever coincides with a position which is motionless but the arrow never is in any point of its course the most we can say is that it might be there in this sense that it passes there and might stop there it is true that if it did stop there it would be at rest there and at this point it is no longer movement that we should have to do with the truth is that if the arrow leaves the point a to fall down at the point b its movement a b is as simple as indecomposable in so far as it is movement as the tension of the bow that shoots it as the shrapnel bursting before it falls to the ground covers the explosive zone with an indivisible danger so the arrow which goes from a to b displays with a single stroke although over a certain extent of duration its indivisible mobility suppose an elastic stretched from a to b could you divide its extension the course of the arrow is this very extension it is equally simple and equally undivided it is a single and unique bound you fix a point c in the interval past and say that at a certain moment the arrow was in c if it had been there it would have been stopped there and you would no longer have had a flight from a to b but two flights one from a to c and the other from c to b with an interval of rest a single movement is entirely by the hypothesis a movement between two stops if there are intermediate stops it is no longer a single movement at bottom the illusion arises from this that the movement once effected has laid along its course a motionless trajectory on which we can count as many immobilities as we will 
from this we conclude that the movement whilst being effected lays at each instant beneath it a position with which it coincides we do not see that the trajectory is created in one stroke although a certain time is required for it and that though we can divide at will the trajectory once created we cannot divide its creation which is an act in progress and not a thing to suppose that the moving body is at a point of its course is to cut the course in two by a snip of the scissors at this point and to substitute two trajectories for the single trajectory which we were first considering it is to distinguish two successive acts where by the hypothesis there is only one in short it is to attribute to the course itself of the arrow everything that can be said of the interval that the arrow has traversed that is to say to admit a priori the absurdity that movement coincides with immobility we shall not dwell here on the three other arguments of zeno we have examined them elsewhere it is enough to point out that they all consist in applying the movement to the line traversed and supposing that what is true of the line is true of the movement the line for example may be divided into as many parts as we wish of any length that we wish and it is always the same line from this we conclude that we have the right to suppose the movement articulated as we wish and that it is always the same movement we thus obtain a series of absurdities that all express the same fundamental absurdity but the possibility of applying the movement to the line traversed exists only for an observer who keeping outside the movement and seeing at every instant the possibility of a stop tries to reconstruct the real movement with these possible immobilities the absurdity vanishes as soon as we adopt by thought the continuity of the real movement a continuity of which every one of us is conscious whenever he lifts an arm or advances a step we feel then indeed that the line passed over between two stops is described with a single indivisible stroke and that we seek in vain to practice on the movement which traces the line divisions corresponding each to each with the divisions arbitrarily chosen of the line once it has been traced the line traversed by the moving body lends itself to any kind of division because it has no internal organization but all movement is articulated inwardly it is either an indivisible bound which may occupy nevertheless a very long duration or a series of indivisible bounds take the articulations of this movement into account or give up speculating on its nature when achilles pursues the tortoise each of his steps must be treated as indivisible and so must each step of the tortoise after a certain number of steps achilles will have overtaken the tortoise there is nothing more simple if you insist on dividing the two motions further distinguish both on the one side and on the other in the course of achilles and in that of the tortoise the sub-multiples of the steps of each of them but respect the natural articulations of the two courses as long as you respect them no difficulty will arise because you will follow the indications of experience but zeno's device is to reconstruct the movement of achilles according to a law arbitrarily chosen achilles with the first step is supposed to arrive at the point where the tortoise was with the second step at the point which it has moved to while he was making the first and so on in this case achilles would always have a new step to take but obviously to overtake the tortoise he goes about it in quite another way the movement considered by zeno would only be the equivalent of the movement of achilles if we could treat the movement as we treat the interval passed through decomposable and recomposable at will once you subscribe to this first absurdity all the others follow nothing would be easier now than to extend zeno's argument to qualitative becoming and to evolutionary becoming we should find the same contradictions in these that the child can become a youth ripen to maturity and decline to old age we understand when we consider that vital evolution is here the reality itself infancy adolescence maturity old age are mere views of the mind possible stops imagined by us from without along the continuity of a progress on the contrary let childhood adolescence maturity and old age be given as integral parts of the evolution they become real stops and we can no longer conceive how evolution is possible for rests placed beside rests will never be equivalent to a movement how with what is made can we reconstitute what is being made how for instance from childhood once posited as a thing shall we pass to adolescence when by the hypothesis childhood only is given if we look at it closely we shall see that our habitual manner of speaking which is fashioned after our habitual manner of thinking leads us to actual logical deadlocks deadlocks to which we allow ourselves to be led without anxiety because we feel confusedly that we can always get out of them if we like all that we have to do in fact is to give up the cinematographical habits of our intellect 
when we say the child becomes a man let us take care not to fathom too deeply the literal meaning of the expression or we shall find that when we posit the subject child the attribute man does not yet apply to it and that when we express the attribute man it applies no more to the subject child the reality which is the transition from childhood to manhood has slipped between our fingers we have only the imaginary stops child and man and we are very near to saying that one of these stops is the other just as the arrow of zeno is according to that philosopher at all the points of the course the truth is that if language here were moulded on reality we should not say the child becomes the man but there is becoming from the child to the man in the first proposition becomes is a verb of indeterminate meaning intended to mask the absurdity into which we fall when we attribute the state man to the subject child it behaves in much the same way as the movement always the same of the cinematographical film a movement hidden in the apparatus and whose function it is to superpose the successive pictures on one another in order to imitate the movement of the real object in the second proposition becoming is a subject it comes to the front it is the reality itself childhood and manhood are then only possible stops mere views of the mind we now have to do with the objective movement itself and no longer with its cinematographical imitation but the first manner of expression is alone conformable to our habits of language we must in order to adopt the second escape from the cinematographical mechanism of thought we must make complete abstraction of this mechanism if we wish to get rid at one stroke of the theoretical absurdities that the question of movement raises all is obscure all is contradictory when we try with states to build up a transition the obscurity is cleared up the contradiction vanishes as soon as we place ourselves along the transition in order to distinguish states in it by making cross cuts therein in thought the reason is that there is more in the transition than the series of states that is to say the possible cuts more in the movement than the series of positions that is to say the possible stops only the first way of looking at things is conformable to the processes of the human mind the second requires on the contrary that we reverse the bent of our intellectual habits no wonder then if philosophy at first recoiled before such an effort the greeks trusted to nature trusted the natural propensity of the mind trusted language above all in so far as it naturally externalizes thought rather than lay blame on the attitude of thought and language toward the course of things they preferred to pronounce the course of things itself to be wrong such indeed was the sentence passed by the philosophers of the eleatic school and they passed it without any reservation whatever as becoming shocks the habits of thought and fits ill into the moulds of language they declared it unreal in spatial movement and in change in general they saw only pure illusion this conclusion could be softened down without changing the premises by saying that the reality changes but that it ought not to change experience confronts us with becoming that is sensible reality but the intelligible reality that which ought to be is more real still and that reality does not change beneath the qualitative becoming beneath the evolutionary becoming beneath the extensive becoming the mind must seek that which defies change the definable quality the form or essence the end such was the fundamental principle of the philosophy which developed throughout the classic age the philosophy of forms or to use a term more akin to the greek the philosophy of ideas the word edos which we translate here by idea has in fact this threefold meaning it denotes one the quality two the form or essence three the end or design in the sense of intention of the act being performed that is to say at bottom the design in the sense of drawing of the act supposed accomplished these three aspects are those of the adjective substantive and verb and correspond to the three essential categories of language after the explanations we have given above we might and perhaps we ought to translate eidos by view or rather by movement for eidos is the stable view taken of the instability of things the quality which is a moment of becoming the form which is a moment of evolution the essence which is the mean form above and below which the other forms are arranged as alterations of the mean finally the intention or mental design which presides over the action being accomplished and which is nothing else we said than the material design traced out and contemplated beforehand of the action accomplished to reduce things to ideas is therefore to resolve becoming into its principal moments each of these being moreover by the hypothesis screened from the laws of time and as it were plucked out of eternity 
that is to say that we end in the philosophy of ideas when we apply the cinematographical mechanism of the intellect to the analysis of the real but when we put immutable ideas at the base of the moving reality a whole physics a whole cosmology a whole theology follows necessarily we must insist on the point not that we mean to summarize in a few pages a philosophy so complex and so comprehensive as that of the greeks but since we have described the cinematographical mechanism of the intellect it is important that we should show to what idea of reality the play of this mechanism leads it is the very idea we believe that we find in the ancient philosophy the main lines of the doctrine that was developed from plato to plotinus passing through aristotle and even in a certain measure through the stoics have nothing accidental nothing contingent nothing that must be regarded as a philosopher's fancy they indicate the vision that a systematic intellect obtains of the universal becoming when regarding it by means of snapshots taken at intervals of its flowing so that even today we shall philosophize in the manner of the greeks we shall rediscover without needing to know them such and such of their general conclusions in the exact proportion that we trust in the cinematographical instinct of our thought we said there is more in a movement than in the successive positions attributed to the moving object more in a becoming than in the forms passed through in turn more in the evolution of form than the forms assumed one after another philosophy can therefore derive terms of the second kind from those of the first but not the first from the second from the first terms speculation must take its start but the intellect reverses the order of the two groups and on this point ancient philosophy proceeds as the intellect does it installs itself in the immutable it posits only ideas yet becoming exists it is a fact how then having posited immutability alone shall we make change come forth from it not by the addition of anything for by the hypothesis there exists nothing positive outside ideas it must therefore be by a diminution so at the base of ancient philosophy lies necessarily this postulate that there is more in the motionless than in the moving and that we pass from immutability to becoming by way of diminution or attenuation it is therefore something negative or zero at most that must be added to ideas to obtain change in that consists the platonic non-being the aristotelian matter a metaphysical zero which joined to the idea like the arithmetical zero to unity multiplies it in space and time by it the motionless and simple idea is refracted into a movement spread out indefinitely in right there ought to be nothing but immutable ideas immutably fitted to each other in fact matter comes to add to them its void and thereby lets loose the universal becoming it is an elusive nothing that creeps between the ideas and creates endless agitation eternal disquiet like a suspicion insinuated between two loving hearts degrade the immutable ideas you obtain by that alone the perpetual flux of things the ideas or forms are the whole of intelligible reality that is to say of truth in that they represent altogether the theoretical equilibrium of being as to sensible reality it is a perpetual oscillation from one side to the other of this point of equilibrium hence throughout the whole philosophy of ideas there is a certain conception of duration as also of the relation of time to eternity he who installs himself in becoming sees in duration the very life of things the fundamental reality the forms which the mind isolates and stores up in concepts are then only snapshots of the changing reality they are moments gathered along the course of time and just because we have cut the thread that binds them to time they no longer endure they tend to withdraw into their own definition that is to say into the artificial reconstruction and symbolical expression which is their intellectual equivalent they enter into eternity if you will but what is eternal in them is just what is unreal on the contrary if we treat becoming by the cinematographical method the forms are no longer snapshots taken of the change they are its constitutive elements they represent all that is positive in becoming eternity no longer hovers over time as an abstraction it underlies time as a reality such is exactly on this point the attitude of the philosophy of forms or ideas it establishes between eternity and time the same relation as between a piece of gold and the small change change so small that payment goes on forever without the debt being paid off the debt could be paid at once with the piece of gold it is this that plato expresses in his magnificent language when he says that god unable to make the world eternal gave it time a moving image of eternity hence also arises a certain conception of extension 
which is at the base of the philosophy of ideas, although it has not been so explicitly brought out. Let us imagine a mind placed alongside becoming and adopting its movement. Each successive state, each quality, each form, in short, will be seen by it as a mere cut made by thought in the universal becoming. It will be found that form is essentially extended, inseparable as it is from the extensity of the becoming which has materialized it in the course of its flow. Every form thus occupies space, as it occupies time. But the philosophy of ideas follows the inverse direction. It starts from the form. It sees in the form the very essence of reality. It does not take form as a snapshot of becoming. It posits forms in the eternal. Of this motionless eternity, then, duration and becoming are supposed to be only the degradation. Form thus posited, independent of time, is then no longer what is found in a perception, it is a concept. And as a reality of the conceptual order occupies no more of extension than it does of duration, the forms must be stationed outside space as well as above time. Space and time have therefore necessarily, in ancient philosophy, the same origin and the same value. The same diminution of being is expressed both by extension in space and detention in time. Both of these are but the distance between what is and what ought to be. From the standpoint of ancient philosophy, space and time can be nothing but the field that an incomplete reality, or rather a reality that has gone astray from itself, needs in order to run in quest of itself. Only it must be admitted that the field is created as the hunting progresses, and that the hunting in some way deposits the field beneath it. Move an imaginary pendulum, a mere mathematical point, from its position of equilibrium. A perpetual oscillation is started, along which points are placed next to points, and moments succeed moments. The space and time which thus arise have no more positivity than the movement itself. They represent the remoteness of the position artificially given to the pendulum from its normal position, what it lacks in order to regain its natural stability. Bring it back to its normal position, space, time and motion shrink to a mathematical point. Just so, human reasonings are drawn out into an endless chain, but are at once swallowed up in the truth seized by intuition, for their extension in space and time is only the distance, so to speak, between thought and truth. So of extension and duration in relation to pure forms or ideas. The sensible forms are before us, ever about to recover their ideality, ever prevented by the matter they bear in them, that is to say, by their inner void, by the interval between what they are and what they ought to be. They are forever on the point of recovering themselves, forever occupied in losing themselves. An inflexible law condemns them, like the rock of Sisyphus, to fall back when they are almost touching the summit, and this law, which has projected them into space and time, is nothing other than the very constancy of their original insufficiency. The alternations of generation and decay, the evolutions ever beginning over and over again, the infinite repetition of the cycles of celestial spheres, this all represents merely a certain fundamental deficit, in which materiality consists. Fill up this deficit, at once you suppress space and time, that is to say, the endlessly renewed oscillations around a stable equilibrium always aimed at, never reached. Things re-enter into each other. What was extended in space is contracted into pure form and past, present and future shrink into a single moment which is eternity. This amounts to saying that physics is but logic spoiled. In this proposition the whole philosophy of ideas is summarized, and in it also is the hidden principle of the philosophy that is innate in our understanding. If immutability is more than becoming, form is more than change, and it is by a veritable fall that the logical system of ideas, rationally subordinated and coordinated amongst themselves, is scattered into a physical series of objects and events accidentally placed one after another. The generative idea of a poem is developed in thousands of imaginations which are materialized in phrases that spread themselves out in words. And the more we descend from the motionless idea wound on itself to the words that unwind it, the more room is left for contingency and choice. Other metaphors, expressed by other words, might have arisen, an image is called up by an image, a word by a word. All these words run now one after another, seeking in vain, by themselves, to give back the simplicity of the generative idea. Our ear only hears the words, it therefore perceives only accidents. But our mind, by successive bounds, leaps from the words to the images, from the images to the original idea, and so gets back, from the perception of words, accidents called up by accidents, to the conception of the idea that posits its own being. So the philosopher proceeds confronted with the universe. 
experience makes to pass before his eyes phenomena which run they also one behind another in an accidental order determined by circumstances of time and place this physical order a degeneration of the logical order is nothing else but the fall of the logical into space and time but the philosopher ascending again from the percept to the concept sees condensed into the logical all the positive reality that the physical possesses his intellect doing away with the materiality that lessens being grasps being itself in the immutable system of ideas thus science is obtained which appears to us complete and ready-made as soon as we put back our intellect into its true place correcting the deviation that separated it from the intelligible science is not then a human construction it is prior to our intellect independent of it veritably the generator of things and indeed if we hold the forms to be simply snapshots taken by the mind of the continuity of becoming they must be relative to the mind that thinks them they can have no independent existence at most we might say that each of these ideas is an ideal but it is in the opposite hypothesis that we are placing ourselves ideas must then exist by themselves ancient philosophy could not escape this conclusion plato formulated it and in vain did aristotle strive to avoid it since movement arises from the degradation of the immutable there could be no movement consequently no sensible world if there were not somewhere immutability realized so having begun by refusing to ideas an independent existence and finding himself nevertheless unable to deprive them of it aristotle pressed them into each other rolled them up into a ball and set above the physical world a form that was thus found to be the form of forms the idea of ideas or to use his own words the thought of thought such is the god of aristotle necessarily immutable and apart from what is happening in the world since he is only the synthesis of all concepts in a single concept it is true that no one of the manifold concepts could exist apart such as it is in the divine unity in vain should we look for the ideas of plato within the god of aristotle but if only we imagine the god of aristotle in a sort of refraction of himself or simply inclining toward the world at once the platonic ideas are seen to pour themselves out of him as if they were involved in the unity of his essence so rays stream out from the sun which nevertheless did not contain them it is probably this possibility of an outpouring of platonic ideas from the aristotelian god that is meant in the philosophy of aristotle by the active intellect the nous that has been called poeticos that is by what is essential and yet unconscious in human intelligence the nous poeticos is science entire posited all at once which the conscious discursive intellect is condemned to reconstruct with difficulty bit by bit there is then within us or rather behind us a possible vision of god as the alexandrians said a vision always virtual never actually realized by the conscious intellect in this intuition we should see god expand in ideas this it is that does everything playing in relation to the discursive intellect which moves in time the same role as the motionless mover himself plays in relation to the movement of the heavens and the course of things there is then immanent in the philosophy of ideas a particular conception of causality which it is important to bring into full light because it is that which each of us will reach when in order to ascend to the origin of things he follows to the end the natural movement of the intellect true the ancient philosophers never formulated it explicitly they confined themselves to drawing the consequences of it and in general they have marked but points of view of it rather than presented it itself sometimes indeed they speak of an attraction sometimes of an impulsion exercised by the prime mover on the whole of the world both views are found in aristotle who shows us in the movement of the universe an aspiration of things toward the divine perfection and consequently an ascent toward god while he describes it elsewhere as the effect of a contact of god with the first sphere and as descending consequently from god to things the alexandrians we think do no more than follow this double indication when they speak of procession and conversion everything is derived from the first principle and everything aspires to return to it but these two conceptions of the divine causality can only be identified together if we bring them both the one and the other back to a third which we hold to be fundamental and which alone will enable us to understand not only why in what sense things move in space and time but also why there is space and time why there is movement why there are things this conception which more and more shows through the reasonings of the greek philosophers as we go from plato to plotinus we may formulate thus the affirmation of a reality implies the simultaneous affirmation of all the degrees of reality intermediate between it and nothing 
the principle is evident in the case of number we cannot affirm the number ten without thereby affirming the existence of the numbers nine eight seven etc in short of the whole interval between ten and zero but here our mind passes naturally from the sphere of quantity to that of quality it seems to us that a certain perfection being given the whole continuity of degradations is given also between this perfection on the one hand and the naught on the other hand that we think we conceive let us then posit the god of aristotle thought of thought that is thought making a circle transforming itself from subject to object and from object to subject by an instantaneous or rather an eternal circular process as on the other hand the naught appears to posit itself and as the two extremities being given the interval between them is equally given it follows that all the descending degrees of being from the divine perfection down to the absolute nothing are realized automatically so to speak when we have posited god let us then run through this interval from top to bottom first of all the slightest diminution of the first principle will be enough to precipitate being into space and time but duration and extension which represent this first diminution will be as near as possible to the divine in extension and eternity we must therefore picture to ourselves this first degradation of the divine principle as a sphere turning on itself imitating by the perpetuity of its circular movement the eternity of the circle of the divine thought creating moreover its own place and thereby place in general since it includes without being included and moves without stirring from the spot creating also its own duration and thereby duration in general since its movement is the measure of all motion then by degrees we shall see the perfection decrease more and more down to our sublunary world in which the cycle of birth growth and decay imitates and mars the original circle for the last time so understood the causal relation between god and the world is seen as an attraction when regarded from below as an impulsion or a contact when regarded from above since the first heaven with its circular movement is an imitation of god and all imitation is the reception of a form therefore we perceive god as efficient cause or as final cause according to the point of view and yet neither of these two relations is the ultimate causal relation the true relation is that which is found between the two members of an equation when the first member is a single term and the second a sum of an endless number of terms it is we may say the relation of the gold piece to the small change if we suppose the change to offer itself automatically as soon as the gold piece is presented only thus can we understand why aristotle has demonstrated the necessity of a first motionless mover not by founding it on the assertion that the movement of things must have had a beginning but on the contrary by affirming that this movement could not have begun and could never come to an end if movement exists or in other words if the small change is being counted the gold piece is to be found somewhere and if the counting goes on forever having never begun the single term that is eminently equivalent to it must be eternal a perpetuity of mobility is possible only if it is backed by an eternity of immutability which it unwinds in a chain without beginning or end such is the last word of the greek philosophy we have not attempted to reconstruct it a priori it has manifold origins it is connected by many invisible threads to the soul of ancient greece vain therefore the effort to deduce it from a simple principle but if everything that has come from poetry religion social life and a still rudimentary physics and biology be removed from it if we take away all the light material that may have been used in the construction of the stately building a solid framework remains and this framework marks out the main lines of a metaphysic which is we believe the natural metaphysic of the human intellect we come to a philosophy of this kind indeed whenever we follow to the end the cinematographical tendency of perception and thought our perception and thought begin by substituting for the continuity of evolutionary change a series of unchangeable forms which are turn by turn caught on the wing like the rings at a merry-go-round which the children unhook with their little stick as they are passing now how can the forms be passing and on what stick are they strung as the stable forms have been obtained by extracting from change everything that is definite there is nothing left to characterize the instability on which the forms are laid but a negative attribute which must be indetermination itself such is the first proceeding of our thought it dissociates each change into two elements the one stable definable for each particular case to wit the form the other indefinable and always the same change in general and such also is the essential operation of language forms are all that it is capable of expressing 
it is reduced to taking as understood or is limited to suggesting a mobility which just because it is always unexpressed is thought to remain in all cases the same then comes in a philosophy that holds the dissociation thus effected by thought and language to be legitimate what can it do except objectify the distinction with more force push it to its extreme consequences reduce it into a system it will therefore construct the real on the one hand with definite forms or immutable elements and on the other with the principle of mobility which being the negation of the form will by the hypothesis escape all definition and be the purely indeterminate the more it directs its attention to the forms delineated by thought and expressed by language the more it will see them rise above the sensible and become subtilized into pure concepts capable of entering one within the other and even of being at last massed together into a single concept the synthesis of all reality the achievement of all perfection the more on the contrary descends toward the invisible source of the universal mobility the more it will feel this mobility sink beneath it and at the same time become void vanish into what it will call the non-being finally it will have on the one hand the system of ideas logically coordinated together or concentrated into one only on the other a quasi naught the platonic non-being or the aristotelian matter but having cut your cloth you must sew it with suprasensible ideas and an infrasensible non-being you now have to reconstruct the sensible world you can do so only if you postulate a kind of metaphysical necessity in virtue of which the confronting of this all with this zero is equivalent to the affirmation of all the degrees of reality that measure the interval between them just as an undivided number when regarded as a difference between itself and zero is revealed as a certain sum of units and with its own affirmation affirms all the lower numbers that is the natural postulate it is that also that we perceive as the base of the greek philosophy in order then to explain the specific characters of each of these degrees of intermediate reality nothing more is necessary than to measure the distance that separates it from the integral reality each lower degree consists in a diminution of the higher and the sensible newness that we perceive in it is resolved from the point of view of the intelligible into a new quantity of negation which is superadded to it the smallest possible quantity of negation that which is found already in the highest forms of sensible reality and consequently a fortiori in the lower forms is that which is expressed by the most general attributes of sensible reality extension and duration by increasing degradations we will obtain attributes more and more special here the philosopher's fancy will have free scope for it is by an arbitrary degree or at least a debatable one that a particular aspect of the sensible world will be equated with a particular diminution of being we shall not necessarily end as aristotle did in a world consisting of concentric spheres turning on themselves but we shall be led to an analogous cosmology i mean to a construction whose pieces though all different will have none the less the same relations between them and this cosmology will be ruled by the same principle the physical will be defined by the logical beneath the changing phenomena will appear to us by transparence a closed system of concepts subordinated to and coordinated with each other science understood as the system of concepts will be more real than the sensible reality it will be prior to human knowledge which is only able to spell it letter by letter prior also to things which awkwardly try to imitate it it would only have to be diverted an instant from itself in order to step out of its eternity and thereby coincide with all this knowledge and all these things its immutability is therefore indeed the cause of the universal becoming such was the point of view of ancient philosophy in regard to change and duration that modern philosophy has repeatedly but especially in its beginnings had the wish to depart from it seems to us unquestionable but an irresistible attraction brings the intellect back to its natural movement and the metaphysic of the moderns to the general conclusions of the greek metaphysic we must try to make this point clear in order to show by what invisible threads our mechanistic philosophy remains bound to the ancient philosophy of ideas and how also it responds to the requirements above all practical of our understanding end of section seventeen Section 18 of Evolution Créatrice by Henri Bergson, translated by Arthur Mitchell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, Part 4 Modern, like ancient science, proceeds according to the cinematographical method. It cannot do otherwise, 
all science is subject to this law for it is of the essence of science to handle signs which it substitutes for the objects themselves these signs undoubtedly differ from those of language by their greater precision and their higher efficacy they are none the less tied down to the general condition of the sign which is to denote a fixed aspect of the reality under an arrested form in order to think movement a constantly renewed effort of the mind is necessary signs are made to dispense us with this effort by substituting for the moving continuity of things an artificial reconstruction which is its equivalent in practice and has the advantage of being easily handled but let us leave aside the means and consider only the end what is the essential object of science it is to enlarge our influence over things science may be speculative in its form disinterested in its immediate ends in other words we may give it as long a credit as it wants but however long the day of reckoning may be put off some time or other the payment must be made it is always then in short practical utility that science has in view even when it launches into theory it is bound to adapt its behavior to the general form of practice however high it may rise it must be ready to fall back into the field of action and at once to get on its feet this would not be possible for it if its rhythm differed absolutely from that of action itself now action we have said proceeds by leaps to act is to readapt oneself to know that is to say to foresee in order to act is then to go from situation to situation from arrangement to rearrangement science may consider rearrangements that come closer and closer to each other it may thus increase the number of moments that it isolates but it always isolates moments as to what happens in the interval between the moments science is no more concerned with that than are our common intelligence our senses and our language it does not bear on the interval but only on the extremities so the cinematographical method forces itself upon our science as it did already on that of the ancients wherein then is the difference between the two sciences we indicated it when we said that the ancients reduced the physical order to the vital order that is to say laws to genera while the moderns try to resolve genera into laws but we have to look at it in another aspect which moreover is only a transposition of the first wherein consists the difference of attitude of the two sciences toward change we may formulate it by saying that ancient science thinks it knows its object sufficiently when it has noted of it some privileged moments whereas modern science considers the object at any moment whatever the forms or ideas of plato or of aristotle correspond to privileged or salient moments in the history of things those in general that have been fixed by language they are supposed like the childhood or the old age of a living being to characterize a period of which they express the quintessence all the rest of this period being filled by the passage of no interest in itself from one form to another form take for instance a falling body it was thought that we got near enough to the fact when we characterized it as a whole it was a movement downward it was the tendency toward a centre it was the natural movement of a body which separated from the earth to which it belonged was now going to find its place again they noted then the final term or culminating point telos axum and set it up as the essential moment this moment that language has retained in order to express the whole of the fact sufficed also for science to characterize it in the physics of aristotle it is by the concepts high and low spontaneous displacement and forced displacement own place and strange place that the movement of a body shot into space or falling freely is defined but galileo thought there was no essential moment no privileged instant to study the falling body is to consider it at it matters not what moment in its course the true science of gravity is that which will determine for any moment of time whatever the position of the body in space for this indeed signs far more precise than those of language are required we may say then that our physics differs from that of the ancients chiefly in the indefinite breaking up of time for the ancients time comprises as many undivided periods as our natural perception and our language cut out in its successive facts each presenting a kind of individuality for that reason each of these facts admits in their view of only a total definition or description if in describing it we are led to distinguish phases in it we have several facts instead of a single one several undivided periods instead of a single period but time is always supposed to be divided into determinate periods and the mode of division to be forced on the mind by apparent crises of the real comparable to that of puberty by the apparent release of a new form 
for a kepler or a galileo on the contrary time is not divided objectively in one way or another by the matter that fills it it has no natural articulations we can we ought to divide it as we please all moments count none of them has the right to set itself up as a moment that represents or dominates the others and consequently we know a change only when we are able to determine what it is about at any one of its moments the difference is profound in fact in a certain aspect it is radical but from the point of view from which we are regarding it it is a difference of degree rather than of kind the human mind has passed from the first kind of knowledge to the second through gradual perfecting simply by seeking a higher precision there is the same relation between these two sciences as between the noting of the phases of a movement by the eye and the much more complete recording of these phases by instantaneous photography it is the same cinematographical mechanism in both cases but it reaches a precision in the second that it cannot have in the first of the gallop of a horse our eye perceives chiefly a characteristic essential or rather schematic attitude a form that appears to radiate over a whole period and so fill up a time of gallop it is this attitude that sculpture has fixed on the frieze of the parthenon but instantaneous photography isolates any moment it puts them all in the same rank and thus the gallop of a horse spreads out for it into as many successive attitudes as it wishes instead of massing itself into a single attitude which is supposed to flash out in a privileged moment and to illuminate a whole period from this original difference flow all the others a science that considers one after the other undivided periods of duration sees nothing but phases succeeding phases forms replacing forms it is content with a qualitative description of objects which it likens to organized beings but when we seek to know what happens within one of these periods at any moment of time we are aiming at something entirely different the changes which are produced from one moment to another are no longer by the hypothesis changes of quality they are quantitative variations it may be of the phenomenon itself it may be of its elementary parts we were right then to say that modern science is distinguishable from the ancient in that it applies to magnitudes and proposes first and foremost to measure them the ancients did indeed try experiments and on the other hand kepler tried no experiment in the proper sense of the word in order to discover a law which is the very type of scientific knowledge as we understand it what distinguishes modern science is not that it is experimental but that it experiments and more generally works only with a view to measure for that reason it is right again to say that ancient science applied to concepts while modern science seeks laws constant relations between variable magnitudes the concept of circularity was sufficient to aristotle to define the movement of the heavenly bodies but even with the more accurate concept of elliptical form kepler did not think he had accounted for the movement of planets he had to get a law that is to say a constant relation between the quantitative variations of two or several elements of the planetary movement yet these are only consequences differences that follow from the fundamental difference it did happen to the ancients accidentally to experiment with a view to measuring as also to discover a law expressing a constant relation between magnitudes the principle of archimedes is a true experimental law it takes into account three variable magnitudes the volume of a body the density of the liquid in which the body is immersed the vertical pressure that is being exerted and it states indeed that one of these three terms is a function of the other two the essential original difference must therefore be sought elsewhere it is the same that we noticed first the science of the ancients is static either it considers in block the change that it studies or if it divides the change into periods it makes of each of these periods a block in its turn which amounts to saying that it takes no account of time but modern science has been built up around the discoveries of galileo and of kepler which immediately furnished it with a model now what do the laws of kepler say they lay down a relation between the areas described by the heliocentric radius vector of a planet and the time employed in describing them a relation between the longer axis of the orbit and the time taken up by the course and what was the principle discovered by galileo a law which connected the space traversed by a falling body with the time occupied by the fall furthermore in what did the first of the great transformations of geometry in modern times consist if not in introducing in a veiled form it is true time and movement even in the consideration of figures for the ancients geometry was a purely static science figures were given to it at once completely finished like the platonic ideas 
but the essence of the cartesian geometry although descartes did not give it this form was to regard every plane curve as described by the movement of a point on a movable straight line which is displaced parallel to itself along the axis of the abscissae the displacement of the movable straight line being supposed to be uniform and the abscissa thus becoming representative of the time the curve is then defined if we can state the relation connecting the space traversed on the movable straight line to the time employed in traversing it that is if we are able to indicate the position of the movable point on the straight line which it traverses at any moment whatever of its course this relation is just what we call the equation of the curve to substitute an equation for a figure consists therefore in seeing the actual position of the moving points in the tracing of the curve at any moment whatever instead of regarding this tracing all at once gathered up in the unique moment when the curve has reached its finished state such then was the directing idea of the reform by which both the science of nature and mathematics which serves as its instrument were renewed modern science is the daughter of astronomy it has come down from heaven to earth along the inclined plane of galileo for it is through galileo that newton and his successors are connected with kepler now how did the astronomical problem present itself to kepler the question was knowing the respective positions of the planets at a given moment how to calculate their positions at any other moment so the same question presented itself henceforth for every material system each material point became a rudimentary planet and the main question the ideal problem whose solution would yield the key to all the others was the positions of these elements at a particular moment being given how to determine their relative positions at any moment no doubt the problem cannot be put in these precise terms except in very simple cases for a schematized reality for we never know the respective positions of the real elements of matter supposing there are real elements and even if we knew them at a given moment the calculation of their positions at another moment would generally require a mathematical effort surpassing human powers but it is enough for us to know that these elements might be known that their present positions might be noted and that a superhuman intellect might by submitting these data to mathematical operations determine the positions of the elements at any other moment of time this conviction is at the bottom of the questions we put to ourselves on the subject of nature and of the methods we employ to solve them that is why every law in static form seems to us as a provisional instalment or as a particular view of a dynamic law which alone would give us a whole and definitive knowledge let us conclude then that our science is not only distinguished from ancient science in this that it seeks laws nor even in this that its laws set forth relations between magnitudes we must add that the magnitude to which we wish to be able to relate all others is time and that modern science must be defined pre-eminently by its aspiration to take time as an independent variable but with what time has it to do we have said before and we cannot repeat too often that the science of matter proceeds like ordinary knowledge it perfects this knowledge increases its precision and its scope but it works in the same direction and puts the same mechanism into play if therefore ordinary knowledge by reason of the cinematographical mechanism to which it is subjected forbears to follow becoming in so far as becoming is moving the science of matter renounces it equally no doubt it distinguishes as great a number of moments as we wish in the interval of time it considers however small the intervals may be at which it stops it authorizes us to divide them again if necessary in contrast with ancient science which stopped at certain so-called essential moments it is occupied indifferently with any moment whatever but it always considers moments always virtual stopping places always in short immobilities which amounts to saying that real time regarded as a flux or in other words as the very mobility of being escapes the hold of scientific knowledge we have already tried to establish this point in a former work we alluded to it again in the first chapter of this book but it is necessary to revert to it once more in order to clear up misunderstandings when positive science speaks of time what it refers to is the movement of a certain mobile t on its trajectory this movement has been chosen by it as representative of time and it is by definition uniform let us call t1 t2 t3 etc points which divide the trajectory of the mobile into equal parts from its origin t0 we shall say that one two three etc units of time have flowed past when the mobile is at the points t1 t2 t3 etc of the line it traverses accordingly to consider the state of the universe at the end of a certain time little t it will be at the point when t is at the point t little t of its course 
but of the flux itself of time still less of its effect on consciousness there is here no question for there enter into the calculation only the points t1 t2 t3 etc taken on the flux never the flux itself we may narrow the time considered as much as we will that is break up at will the interval between two consecutive divisions tn and tn plus one but it is always with points and with points only that we are dealing what we retain of the movement of the mobile t are positions taken on its trajectory what we retain of all the other points of the universe are their positions on their respective trajectories to each virtual stop of the moving body t at the points of division t1 t2 t3 etc we make correspond a virtual stop of all the other mobiles at the points where they are passing and when we say that a movement or any other change has occupied a time little t we mean by it that we have noted a number of little t of correspondences of this kind we have therefore counted simultaneities we have not concerned ourselves with the flux that goes from one to another the proof of this is that i can at discretion vary the rapidity of the flux of the universe in regard to a consciousness that is independent of it and that would perceive the variation by the quite qualitative feeling that it would have of it whatever the variation had been since the movement of t would participate in this variation i should have nothing to change in my equations nor in the numbers that figure in them let us go further suppose that the rapidity of the flux becomes infinite imagine as we said in the first pages of this book that the trajectory of the mobile t is given at once and that the whole history past present and future of the material universe is spread out instantaneously in space the same mathematical correspondences will subsist between the moments of the history of the world unfolded like a fan so to speak and the divisions t1 t2 t3 etc of the line which will be called by definition the course of time in the eyes of science nothing will have changed but if time thus spreading itself out in space and succession becoming juxtaposition science has nothing to change in what it tells us we must conclude that in what it tells us it takes account neither of succession in what of it is specific nor of time in what there is in it that is fluent it has no sign to express what strikes our consciousness in succession and duration it no more applies to becoming so far as that is moving than the bridges thrown here and there across the stream follow the water that flows under their arches yet succession exists i am conscious of it it is a fact when a physical process is going on before my eyes my perception and my inclination have nothing to do with accelerating or retarding it what is important to the physicist is the number of units of duration the process fills he does not concern himself about the units themselves and that is why the successive states of the world might be spread out all at once in space without his having to change anything in his science or to cease talking about time but for us conscious beings it is the units that matter for we do not count extremities of intervals we feel and live the intervals themselves now we are conscious of these intervals as of definite intervals let me come back again to the sugar in my glass of water why must i wait for it to melt while the duration of the phenomenon is relative for the physicist since it is reduced to a certain number of units of time and the units themselves are indifferent this duration is an absolute for my consciousness for it coincides with a certain degree of impatience which is rigorously determined whence comes this determination what is it that obliges me to wait and to wait for a certain length of psychical duration which is forced upon me over which i have no power if succession in so far as distinct from mere juxtaposition has no real efficacy if time is not a kind of force why does the universe unfold its successive states with a velocity which in regard to my consciousness is a veritable absolute why with this particular velocity rather than any other why not with an infinite velocity why in other words is not everything given at once as on the film of the cinematograph the more i consider this point the more it seems to me that if the future is bound to succeed the present instead of being given alongside of it it is because the future is not altogether determined at the present moment and that if the time taken up by this succession is something other than a number if it has for the consciousness that is installed in it absolute value and reality it is because there is unceasingly being created in it not indeed in any such artificially isolated system as a glass of sugared water but in the concrete whole of which every such system forms part something unforeseeable and new this duration may not be the fact of matter itself but that of the life which reascends the course of matter the two movements are none the less mutually dependent upon each other 
the duration of the universe must therefore be one with the latitude of creation which can find place in it when a child plays at reconstructing a picture by putting together the separate pieces in a puzzle game the more he practices the more and more quickly he succeeds the reconstruction was moreover instantaneous the child found it ready-made when he opened the box on leaving the shop the operation therefore does not require a definite time and indeed theoretically it does not require any time that is because the result is given it is because the picture is already created and because to obtain it requires only a work of recomposing and rearranging a work that can be supposed going faster and faster and even infinitely fast up to the point of being instantaneous but to the artist who creates a picture by drawing it from the depths of his soul time is no longer an accessory it is not an interval that may be lengthened or shortened without the content being altered the duration of his work is part and parcel of his work to contract or to dilate it would be to modify both the psychical evolution that fills it and the invention which is its goal the time taken up by the invention is one with the invention itself it is the progress of a thought which is changing in the degree and measure that it is taking form it is a vital process something like the ripening of an idea the painter is before his canvas the colors are on the palette the model is sitting all this we see and also we know the painter's style do we foresee what will appear on the canvas we possess the elements of the problem we know in an abstract way how it will be solved for the portrait will surely resemble the model and will surely resemble also the artist but the concrete solution brings with it that unforeseeable nothing which is everything in a work of art and it is this nothing that takes time naught as matter it creates itself as form the sprouting and flowering of this form are stretched out on an unshrinkable duration which is one with their essence so of the works of nature their novelty arises from an internal impetus which is progress or succession which confers on succession a peculiar virtue or which owes to succession the whole of its virtue which at any rate makes succession or continuity of interpenetration in time irreducible to a mere instantaneous juxtaposition in space this is why the idea of reading in a present state of the material universe the future of living forms and of unfolding now their history yet to come involves a veritable absurdity but this absurdity is difficult to bring out because our memory is accustomed to place alongside of each other in an ideal space the terms it perceives in turn because it always represents past succession in the form of juxtaposition it is able to do so indeed just because the past belongs to that which is already invented to the dead and no longer to creation and to life then as the succession to come will end by being a succession past we persuade ourselves that the duration to come admits of the same treatment as past duration that is even now unrollable that the future is there rolled up already painted on the canvas an illusion no doubt but an illusion that is natural ineradicable and that will last as long as the human mind time is invention or it is nothing at all but of time invention physics can take no account restricted as it is to the cinematographical method it is limited to counting simultaneities between the events that make up this time and the positions of the mobile t on its trajectory it detaches these events from the whole which at every moment puts on a new form and which communicates to them something of its novelty it considers them in the abstract such as they would be outside of the living whole that is to say in a time unrolled in space it retains only the events or systems of events that can be thus isolated without being made to undergo too profound a deformation because only these lend themselves to the application of its method our physics dates from the day when it was known how to isolate such systems to sum up while modern physics is distinguished from ancient physics by the fact that it considers any moment of time whatever it rests altogether on a substitution of time length for time invention it seems then that parallel to this physics a second kind of knowledge ought to have grown up which could have retained what physics allowed to escape on the flux itself of duration science neither would nor could lay hold bound as it was to the cinematographical method this second kind of knowledge would have set the cinematographical method aside it would have called upon the mind to renounce its most cherished habits it is within becoming that it would have transported us by an effort of sympathy we should no longer be asking where a moving body will be what shape a system will take through what state a change will pass at a given moment the moments of time which are only arrests of our attention would no longer exist it is the flow of time it is the very flux of the real that we should be trying to follow 
the first kind of knowledge has the advantage of enabling us to foresee the future and of making us in some measure masters of events in return it retains of the moving reality only eventual immobilities that is to say views taken of it by our mind it symbolizes the real and transposes it into the human rather than expresses it the other knowledge if it is possible is practically useless it will not extend our empire over nature it will even go against certain natural aspirations of the intellect but if it succeeds it is reality itself that it will hold in a firm and final embrace not only may we thus complete the intellect and its knowledge of matter by accustoming it to install itself within the moving but by developing also another faculty complementary to the intellect we may open a perspective on the other half of the real for as soon as we are confronted with true duration we see that it means creation and that if that which is being unmade endures it can only be because it is inseparably bound to what is making itself thus will appear the necessity of a continual growth of the universe i should say of a life of the real and thus will be seen in a new light the life which we find on the surface of our planet a life directed the same way as that of the universe and inverse of materiality to intellect in short there will be added intuition the more we reflect on it the more we shall find that this conception of metaphysics is that which modern science suggests for the ancients indeed time is theoretically negligible because the duration of a thing only manifests the degradation of its essence it is with this motionless essence that science has to deal change being only the effort of a form toward its own realization the realization is all that it concerns us to know no doubt the realization is never complete it is this that ancient philosophy expresses by saying that we do not perceive form without matter but if we consider the changing object at a certain essential moment at its apogee we may say that there it just touches its intelligible form this intelligible form this ideal and so to speak limiting form our science seizes upon and possessing in this the gold piece it holds eminently the small money which we call becoming or change this change is less than being the knowledge that would take it for object supposing such knowledge were possible would be less than science but for a science that places all the moments of time in the same rank that admits no essential moment no culminating point no apogee change is no longer a diminution of essence duration is not a dilution of eternity the flux of time is the reality itself and the things which we study are the things which flow it is true that of this flowing reality we are limited to taking instantaneous views but just because of this scientific knowledge must appeal to another knowledge to complete it while the ancient conception of scientific knowledge ended in making time a degradation and changed the diminution of a form given from all eternity on the contrary by following the new conception to the end we should come to see in time a progressive growth of the absolute and in the evolution of things a continual invention of forms ever new it is true that it would be to break with the metaphysics of the ancients they saw only one way of knowing definitely their science consisted in a scattered and fragmentary metaphysics their metaphysics in a concentrated and systematic science their science and metaphysics were at most two species of one and the same genus in our hypothesis on the contrary science and metaphysics are two opposed although complementary ways of knowing the first retaining only moments that is to say that which does not endure the second bearing on duration itself now it was natural to hesitate between so novel a conception of metaphysics and the traditional conception the temptation must have been strong to repeat with the new science what had been tried on the old to suppose our scientific knowledge of nature completed at once to unify it entirely and to give to this unification as the greeks had already done the name of metaphysics so beside the new way that philosophy might have prepared the old remained open that indeed which physics trod and as physics retained of time only what could as well be spread out all at once in space the metaphysics that chose the same direction had necessarily to proceed as if time created and annihilated nothing as if duration had no efficacy bound like the physics of the moderns and the metaphysics of the ancients to the cinematographical method it ended with the conclusion implicitly admitted at the start and immanent in the method itself all is given end of section eighteen Section 19 of Evolution Créatrice by Henri Bergson, translated by Arthur Mitchell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4, Part 5. 
that metaphysics hesitated at first between the two paths seems to us unquestionable the indecision is visible in cartesianism on the one hand descartes affirms universal mechanism from this point of view movement would be relative and as time has just as much reality as movement it would follow that past present and future are given from all eternity but on the other hand and that is why the philosopher has not gone to these extreme consequences descartes believes in the free will of man he superposes on the determinism of physical phenomena the indeterminism of human actions and consequently on time length a time in which there is invention creation true succession this duration he supports on a god who is unceasingly renewing the creative act and who being thus tangent to time and becoming sustains them communicates to them necessarily something of his absolute reality when he places himself at this second point of view descartes speaks of movement even spatial as of an absolute he therefore entered both roads one after the other having resolved to follow neither of them to the end the first would have led him to the denial of free will in man and of real will in god it was the suppression of all efficient duration the likening of the universe to a thing given which a superhuman intelligence would embrace at once in a moment or in eternity in following the second on the contrary he would have been led to all the consequences which the intuition of true duration implies creation would have appeared not simply as continued but also as continuous the universe regarded as a whole would really evolve the future would no longer be determinable by the present at most we might say that once realized it can be found again in its antecedents as the sounds of a new language can be expressed with the letters of an old alphabet if we agree to enlarge the value of the letters and to attribute to them retroactively sounds which no combination of the old sounds could have produced beforehand finally the mechanistic explanation might have remained universal in this that it can indeed be extended to as many systems as we choose to cut out in the continuity of the universe but mechanism would then have become a method rather than a doctrine it would have expressed the fact that science must proceed after the cinematographical manner that the function of science is to scan the rhythm of the flow of things and not to fit itself into that flow such were the two opposite conceptions of metaphysics which were offered to philosophy it chose the first the reason of this choice is undoubtedly the mind's tendency to follow the cinematographical method a method so natural to our intellect and so well adjusted also to the requirements of our science that we must feel doubly sure of its speculative impotence to renounce it in metaphysics but ancient philosophy also influenced the choice artists forever admirable the greeks created a type of suprasensible truth as of sensible beauty whose attraction is hard to resist as soon as we incline to make metaphysics a systematization of science we glide in the direction of plato and of aristotle and once in the zone of attraction in which the greek philosophers moved we are drawn along in their orbit such was the case with leibniz as also with spinoza we are not blind to the treasures of originality their doctrines contain spinoza and leibniz have poured into them the whole content of their souls rich with the inventions of their genius and the acquisitions of modern thought and there are in each of them especially in spinoza flashes of intuition that break through the system but if we leave out of the two doctrines what breathes life into them if we retain the skeleton only we have before us the very picture of platonism and aristotelianism seen through cartesian mechanism they present to us a systematization of the new physics constructed on the model of the ancient metaphysics what indeed could the unification of physics be the inspiring idea of that science was to isolate within the universe systems of material points such that the position of each of these points being known at a given moment we could then calculate it for any moment whatever as moreover the systems thus defined were the only ones on which the new science had hold and as it could not be known beforehand whether a system satisfied or did not satisfy the desired condition it was useful to proceed always and everywhere as if the condition was realized there was in this a methodological rule a very natural rule so natural indeed that it was not even necessary to formulate it for simple common sense tells us that when we are possessed of an effective instrument of research and are ignorant of the limits of its applicability we should act as if its applicability were unlimited there will always be time to abate it 
but the temptation must have been great for the philosopher to hypostatize this hope or rather this impetus of the new science and to convert a general rule of method into a fundamental law of things so he transported himself at once to the limit he supposed physics to have become complete and to embrace the whole of the sensible world the universe became a system of points the position of which was rigorously determined at each instant by relation to the preceding instant and theoretically calculable for any moment whatever the result in short was universal mechanism but it was not enough to formulate this mechanism what was required was to found it to give the reason for it and prove its necessity and the essential affirmation of mechanism being that of a reciprocal mathematical dependence of all the points of the universe as also of all the moments of the universe the reason of mechanism had to be discovered in the unity of a principle into which could be contracted all that is juxtaposed in space and successive in time hence the whole of the real was supposed to be given at once the reciprocal determination of the juxtaposed appearances in space was explained by the indivisibility of true being and the inflexible determinism of successive phenomena in time simply expressed that the whole of being is given in the eternal the new philosophy was going then to be a recommencement or rather a transposition of the old the ancient philosophy had taken each of the concepts into which a becoming is concentrated or which mark its apogee it supposed them all known and gathered them up into a single concept form of forms idea of ideas like the god of aristotle the new philosophy was going to take each of the laws which condition a becoming in relation to others and which are as the permanent substratum of phenomena it would suppose them all known and would gather them up into a unity which also would express them eminently but which like the god of aristotle and for the same reasons must remain immutably shut up in itself true this return to the ancient philosophy was not without great difficulties when a plato an aristotle or a plotinus melt all the concepts of their science into a single one in so doing they embrace the whole of the real for concepts are supposed to represent the things themselves and to possess at least as much positive content but a law in general expresses only a relation and physical laws in particular express only quantitative relations between concrete things so that if a modern philosopher works with the laws of the new science as the greek philosopher did with the concepts of the ancient science if he makes all the conclusions of a physics supposed omniscient converge on a single point he neglects what is concrete in the phenomena the qualities perceived the perceptions themselves his synthesis comprises it seems only a fraction of reality in fact the first result of the new science was to cut the real into two halves quantity and quality the former being credited to the account of bodies and the latter to the account of souls the ancients had raised no such barriers either between quality and quantity or between soul and body for them the mathematical concepts were concepts like the others related to the others and fitting quite naturally into the hierarchy of the ideas neither was the body then defined by geometrical extension nor the soul by consciousness if the funke of aristotle the entelechy of a living body is less spiritual than our soul it is because his ulma already impregnated with the idea is less corporeal than our body the scission was not yet irremediable between the two terms it has become so and thence a metaphysic that aims at an abstract unity must resign itself either to comprehend in its synthesis only one half of the real or to take advantage of the absolute heterogeneity of the two halves in order to consider one as a translation of the other different phrases will express different things if they belong to the same language that is to say if there is a certain relationship of sound between them but if they belong to two different languages they might just because of their radical diversity of sound express the same thing so of quality and quantity of soul and body it is for having cut all connection between the two terms that philosophers have been led to establish between them a rigorous parallelism of which the ancients had not dreamed to regard them as translations and not as inversions of each other in short to posit a fundamental identity as a substratum to their duality the synthesis to which they rose thus became capable of embracing everything a divine mechanism made the phenomena of thought to correspond to those of extension each to each qualities to quantities souls to bodies it is this parallelism that we find both in leibniz and in spinoza in different forms it is true because of the unequal importance which they attach to extension with spinoza the two terms thought and extension are placed in principle at least in the same rank 
they are therefore two translations of one and the same original or as spinoza says two attributes of one and the same substance which we must call god and these two translations as also an infinity of others into languages which we know not are called up and even forced into existence by the original just as the essence of the circle is translated automatically so to speak both by a figure and by an equation for leibniz on the contrary extension is indeed still a translation but it is thought that is the original and thought might dispense with translation the translation being made only for us in positing god we necessarily posit also all the possible views of god that is to say the monads but we can always imagine that a view has been taken from a point of view and it is natural for an imperfect mind like ours to class views qualitatively different according to the order and position of points of view qualitatively identical from which the views might have been taken in reality the points of view do not exist for there are only views each given in an indivisible block and representing in its own way the whole of reality which is god but we need to express the plurality of the views that are unlike each other by the multiplicity of the points of view that are exterior to each other and we also need to symbolize the more or less close relationship between the views by the relative situation of the points of view to one another their nearness or their distance that is to say by a magnitude that is what leibniz means when he says that space is the order of coexistence that the perception of extension is a confused perception that is to say a perception relative to an imperfect mind and that nothing exists but monads expressing thereby that the real whole has no parts but is repeated to infinity each time integrally though diversely within itself and that all these repetitions are complementary to each other in just the same way the visible relief of an object is equivalent to the whole set of stereoscopic views taken of it from all points so that instead of seeing in the relief a juxtaposition of solid parts we might quite as well look upon it as made of the reciprocal complementarity of these whole views each given in block each indivisible each different from all the others and yet representative of the same thing the whole that is to say god is this very relief for leibniz and the monads are these complementary plane views for that reason he defines god as the substance that has no point of view or again as the universal harmony that is to say the reciprocal complementarity of monads in short leibniz differs from spinoza in this that he looks upon the universal mechanism as an aspect which reality takes for us whereas spinoza makes of it an aspect which reality takes for itself it is true that after having concentrated in god the whole of the real it became difficult for them to pass from god to things from eternity to time the difficulty was even much greater for these philosophers than an aristotle or a plotinus the god of aristotle indeed had been obtained by the compression and reciprocal compenetration of the ideas that represent in their finished state or in their culminating point the changing things of the world he was therefore transcendent to the world and the duration of things was juxtaposed to his eternity of which it was only a weakening but in the principle to which we are led by the consideration of universal mechanism and which must serve as its substratum it is not concepts or things but laws or relations that are condensed now a relation does not exist separately a law connects changing terms and is immanent in what it governs the principle in which all these relations are ultimately summed up and which is the basis of the unity of nature cannot therefore be transcendent to sensible reality it is immanent in it and we must suppose that it is at once both in and out of time gathered up in the unity of its substance and yet condemned to wind it off in an endless chain rather than formulate so appalling a contradiction the philosophers were necessarily led to sacrifice the weaker of the two terms and to regard the temporal aspect of things as a mere illusion leibniz says so in explicit terms for he makes of time as of space a confused perception while the multiplicity of his monads expresses only the diversity of views taken of the whole the history of an isolated monad seems to be hardly anything else than the manifold views that it can take of its own substance so that time would consist in all the points of view that each monad can assume towards itself as space consists in all the points of view that all monads can assume toward god but the thought of spinoza is much less clear and this philosopher seems to have sought to establish between eternity and that which has duration the same difference as aristotle made between essence and accidents a most difficult undertaking for the nulli of aristotle was no longer there to measure the distance and explain the passage from the essential to the accidental descartes having eliminated it forever 
however that may be the deeper we go into the spinozistic conception of the inadequate as related to the adequate the more we feel ourselves moving in the direction of aristotelianism just as the leibnizian monads in proportion as they mark themselves out the more clearly tend to approximate the intelligibles of plotinus the natural trend of these two philosophies brings them back to the conclusions of the ancient philosophy to sum up the resemblances of this new metaphysic to that of the ancients arise from the fact that they both suppose ready-made the former above the sensible the latter within the sensible a science one and complete with which any reality that the sensible may contain is believed to coincide for both reality as well as truth are integrally given in eternity both are opposed to the idea of a reality that creates itself gradually that is at bottom to an absolute duration now it might easily be shown that the conclusions of this metaphysic springing from science have rebounded upon science itself as it were by ricochet they penetrate the whole of our so-called empiricism physics and chemistry study only inert matter biology when it treats the living being physically and chemically considers only the inert side of the living hence the mechanistic explanations in spite of their development include only a small part of the real to suppose a priori that the whole of the real is resolvable into elements of this kind or at least that mechanism can give a complete translation of what happens in the world is to pronounce for a certain metaphysic the very metaphysic of which spinoza and leibniz have laid down the principles and drawn the consequences certainly the psychophysiologist who affirms the exact equivalence of the cerebral and the psychical state who imagines the possibility for some superhuman intellect of reading in the brain what is going on in consciousness believes himself very far from the metaphysicians of the seventeenth century and very near to experience yet experience pure and simple tells us nothing of the kind it shows us the interdependence of the mental and the physical the necessity of a certain cerebral substratum for the psychical state nothing more from the fact that two things are mutually dependent it does not follow that they are equivalent because a certain screw is necessary to a certain machine because the machine works when the screw is there and stops when the screw is taken away we do not say that the screw is the equivalent of the machine for correspondence to be equivalence it would be necessary that to any part of the machine a definite part of the screw should correspond as in a literal translation in which each chapter renders a chapter each sentence a sentence each word a word now the relation of the brain to consciousness seems to be entirely different not only does the hypothesis of an equivalence between the psychical state and the cerebral state imply a downright absurdity as we have tried to prove in a former essay but the facts examined without prejudice certainly seem to indicate that the relation of the psychical to the physical is just that of the machine to the screw to speak of an equivalence between the two is simply to curtail and make almost unintelligible the spinozistic or leibnizian metaphysic it is to accept this philosophy such as it is on the side of extension but to mutilate it on the side of thought with spinoza with leibniz we suppose the unifying synthesis of the phenomena of matter achieved and everything in matter explained mechanically but for the conscious facts we no longer push the synthesis to the end we stop halfway we suppose consciousness to be coextensive with a certain part of nature and not with all of it we are thus led sometimes to an epiphenomenalism that associates consciousness with certain particular vibrations and puts it here and there in the world in a sporadic state and sometimes to a monism that scatters consciousness into as many tiny grains as there are atoms but in either case it is to an incomplete spinozism or to an incomplete leibnizianism that we come back between this conception of nature and cartesianism we find moreover intermediate historical stages the medical philosophers of the eighteenth century with their cramped cartesianism have had a great part in the genesis of the epiphenomenalism and monism of the present day end of section nineteen section twenty of evolution creatrice by henri bergson translated by arthur mitchell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four part six these doctrines are thus found to fall short of the kantian criticism certainly the philosophy of kant is also imbued with the belief in a science single and complete embracing the whole of the real indeed looked at from one aspect it is only a continuation of the metaphysics of the moderns and a transposition of the ancient metaphysics spinoza and leibniz had following aristotle hypostatized in god the unity of knowledge 
the kantian criticism on one side at least consists in asking whether the whole of this hypothesis is necessary to modern science as it was to ancient science or if part of the hypothesis is not sufficient for the ancients science applied to concepts that is to say to kinds of things in compressing all concepts into one they therefore necessarily arrived at a being which we may call thought but which was rather thought object than thought subject when aristotle defined god the noesios noesis it is probably on noesios and not on noesis that he put the emphasis god was the synthesis of all concepts the idea of ideas but modern science turns on laws that is on relations now a relation is a bond established by a mind between two or more terms a relation is nothing outside of the intellect that relates the universe therefore can only be a system of laws if phenomena have passed beforehand through the filter of an intellect of course this intellect might be that of a being infinitely superior to man who would found the materiality of things at the same time that he bound them together such was the hypothesis of leibniz and of spinoza but it is not necessary to go so far and for the effect we have here to obtain the human intellect is enough such is precisely the kantian solution between the dogmatism of a spinoza or a leibniz and the criticism of kant there is just the same distance as between it may be maintained that and it suffices that kant stops this dogmatism on the incline that was making it slip too far toward the greek metaphysics he reduces to the strict minimum the hypothesis which is necessary in order to suppose the physics of galileo indefinitely extensible true when he speaks of the human intellect he means neither yours nor mine the unity of nature comes indeed from the human understanding that unifies but the unifying function that operates here is impersonal it imparts itself to our individual consciousnesses but it transcends them it is much less than a substantial god it is however a little more than the isolated work of a man or even than the collective work of humanity it does not exactly lie within man rather man lies within it as in an atmosphere of intellectuality which his consciousness breathes it is if we will a formal god something that in kant is not yet divine but which tends to become so it became so indeed with fichte with kant however its principal role was to give to the whole of our science a relative and human character although of a humanity already somewhat deified from this point of view the criticism of kant consisted chiefly in limiting the dogmatism of his predecessors accepting their conception of science and reducing to a minimum the metaphysic it implied but it is otherwise with the kantian distinction between the matter of knowledge and its form by regarding intelligence as pre-eminently a faculty of establishing relations kant attributed an extra intellectual origin to the terms between which the relations are established he affirmed against his immediate predecessors that knowledge is not entirely resolvable into terms of intelligence he brought back into philosophy while modifying it and carrying it on to another plane that essential element of the philosophy of descartes which has been abandoned by the cartesians thereby he prepared the way for a new philosophy which might have established itself in the extra intellectual matter of knowledge by a higher effort of intuition coinciding with this matter adopting the same rhythm and the same movement might not consciousness by two efforts of opposite direction raising itself and lowering itself by turns become able to grasp from within and no longer perceive only from without the two forms of reality body and mind would not this twofold effort make us as far as that is possible relive the absolute moreover as in the course of this operation we should see intellect spring up of itself cut itself out in the whole of mind intellectual knowledge would then appear as it is limited but not relative such was the direction that kantianism might have pointed out to a revivified cartesianism but in this direction kant himself did not go he would not because while assigning to knowledge an extra intellectual matter he believed this matter to be either coextensive with intellect or less extensive than intellect therefore he could not dream of cutting out intellect in it nor consequently of tracing the genesis of the understanding and its categories the moulds of the understanding and the understanding itself had to be accepted as they are already made between the matter presented to our intellect and this intellect itself there was no relationship the agreement between the two was due to the fact that intellect imposed its form on matter so that not only was it necessary to posit the intellectual form of knowledge as a kind of absolute and give up the quest of its genesis but the very matter of this knowledge seemed too ground down by the intellect for us to be able to hope to get it back in its original purity it was not the thing in itself 
it was only the refraction of it through our atmosphere if we now inquire why kant did not believe that the matter of our knowledge extends beyond its form this is what we find the criticism of our knowledge of nature that was instituted by kant consisted in ascertaining what our mind must be and what nature must be if the claims of our science are justified but of these claims themselves kant has not made the criticism i mean that he took for granted the idea of a science that is one capable of binding with the same force all the parts of what is given and of coordinating them into a system presenting on all sides an equal solidity he did not consider in his critique of pure reason that science became less and less objective more and more symbolical to the extent that it went from the physical to the vital from the vital to the psychical experience does not move to his view in two different and perhaps opposite ways the one conformable to the direction of the intellect the other contrary to it there is for him only one experience and the intellect covers its whole ground this is what kant expresses by saying that all our intuitions are sensuous or in other words infra-intellectual and this would have to be admitted indeed if our science presented in all its parts an equal objectivity but suppose on the contrary that science is less and less objective more and more symbolical as it goes from the physical to the psychical passing through the vital then as it is indeed necessary to perceive a thing somehow in order to symbolize it there would be an intuition of the psychical and more generally of the vital which the intellect would transpose and translate no doubt but which would none the less transcend the intellect there would be in other words a super intellectual intuition if this intuition exist a taking possession of the spirit by itself is possible and no longer only a knowledge that is external and phenomenal what is more if we have an intuition of this kind i mean an ultra intellectual intuition then sensuous intuition is likely to be in continuity with it through certain intermediaries as the infrared is continuous with the ultraviolet sensuous intuition itself therefore is promoted it will no longer attain only the phantom of an unattainable thing in itself it is provided we bring to it certain indispensable corrections into the absolute itself that it will introduce us so long as it was regarded as the only material of our science it reflected back on all science something of the relativity which strikes a scientific knowledge of spirit and thus the perception of bodies which is the beginning of the science of bodies seemed itself to be relative relative therefore seemed to be sensuous intuition but this is not the case if distinctions are made between the different sciences and if the scientific knowledge of the spiritual and also consequently of the vital be regarded as the more or less artificial extension of a certain manner of knowing which applied to bodies is not at all symbolical let us go further if there are thus two intuitions of different order the second being obtained by a reversal of the direction of the first and if it is toward the second that the intellect naturally inclines there is no essential difference between the intellect and this intuition itself the barriers between the matter of sensible knowledge and its form are lowered and also between the pure forms of sensibility and the categories of the understanding the matter and form of intellectual knowledge restricted to its own object are seen to be engendering each other by a reciprocal adaptation intellect modeling itself on corporeity and corporeity on intellect but this duality of intuition kant neither would nor could admit it would have been necessary in order to admit it to regard duration as the very stuff of reality and consequently to distinguish between the substantial duration of things and time spread out in space it would have been necessary to regard space itself and the geometry which is immanent in space as an ideal limit in the direction of which material things develop but which they do not actually attain nothing could be more contrary to the letter and perhaps also to the spirit of the critique of pure reason no doubt knowledge is presented to us in it as an ever open role experience as a push of facts that is forever going on but according to kant these facts are spread out on one plane as fast as they arise they are external to each other and external to the mind of a knowledge from within that could grasp them in their springing forth instead of taking them already sprung that would dig between space and spatialized time there is never any question yet it is indeed beneath this plane that our consciousness places us there flows true duration in this respect also kant is very near his predecessors between the non-temporal and the time that is spread out in distinct moments he admits no mean and as there is indeed no intuition that carries us into the non-temporal all intuition is thus found to be sensuous by definition but between physical existence which is spread out in space and non-temporal existence which can only be a conceptual and logical existence like that of which metaphysical dogmatism speaks is there not room for consciousness and for life there is unquestionably 
we perceive it when we place ourselves in duration in order to go from that duration to moments instead of starting from moments in order to bind them again and to construct duration yet it was to a non-temporal intuition that the immediate successors of kant turned in order to escape from the kantian relativism certainly the ideas of becoming of progress of evolution seem to occupy a large place in their philosophy but does duration really play a part in it real duration is that in which each form flows out of previous forms while adding to them something new and is explained by them as much as it explains them but to deduce this form directly from one complete being which it is supposed to manifest is to return to spinozism it is like leibniz and spinoza to deny to duration all efficient action the post-kantian philosophy severe as it may have been on the mechanistic theories accepts from mechanism the idea of a science that is one and the same for all kinds of reality and it is nearer to mechanism than it imagines for though in the consideration of matter of life and of thought it replaces the successive degrees of complexity that mechanism supposed by degrees of the realization of an idea or by degrees of the objectification of a will it still speaks of degrees and these degrees are those of a scale which being traverses in a single direction in short it makes out the same articulations in nature that mechanism does of mechanism it retains the whole design it merely gives it a different colouring but it is the design itself or at least one half of the design that needs to be remade if we are to do that we must give up the method of construction which was that of kant's successors we must appeal to experience an experience purified or in other words released where necessary from the moulds that our intellect has formed in the degree and proportion of the progress of our action on things an experience of this kind is not a non-temporal experience it only seeks beyond the spatialized time in which we believe we see continual rearrangements between the parts that concrete duration in which a radical recasting of the whole is always going on it follows the real in all its sinuosities it does not lead us like the method of construction to higher and higher generalities piled up stories of a magnificent building but then it leaves no play between the explanations it suggests and the objects it has to explain it is the detail of the real and no longer only the whole in a lump that it claims to illumine end of section 20section twenty one of evolution creatrice by henri bergson translated by arthur mitchell this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four part seven that the thought of the nineteenth century called for a philosophy of this kind rescued from the arbitrary capable of coming down to the detail of particular facts is unquestionable unquestionably also it felt that this philosophy ought to establish itself in what we call concrete duration the advent of the moral sciences the progress of psychology the growing importance of embryology among the biological sciences all this was bound to suggest the idea of a reality which endures inwardly which is duration itself so when a philosopher arose who announced a doctrine of evolution in which the progress of matter toward perceptibility would be traced together with the advance of the mind toward rationality in which the complication of correspondences between the external and the internal would be followed step by step in which change would become the very substance of things to him all eyes were turned the powerful attraction that spencerian evolutionism has exercised on contemporary thought is due to that very cause however far spencer may seem to be from kant however ignorant indeed he may have been of kantianism he felt nevertheless at his first contact with the biological sciences the direction in which philosophy could continue to advance without laying itself open to the kantian criticism but he had no sooner started to follow the path than he turned off short he had promised to retrace a genesis and lo he was doing something entirely different his doctrine bore indeed the name of evolutionism it claimed to remount and redescend the course of the universal becoming but in fact it dealt neither with becoming nor with evolution we need not enter here into a profound examination of this philosophy let us say merely that the usual device of the spencerian method consists in reconstructing evolution with fragments of the evolved if i paste a picture on a card and then cut up the card into bits i can reproduce the picture by rightly grouping again the small pieces and a child who working thus with the pieces of a puzzle picture and putting together unformed fragments of the picture finally obtains a pretty coloured design no doubt imagines that he has produced design and colour 
yet the act of drawing and painting has nothing to do with that of putting together the fragments of a picture already drawn and already painted so by combining together the most simple results of evolution you may imitate well or ill the most complex effects but of neither the simple nor the complex will you have retraced the genesis and the addition of evolved to evolved will bear no resemblance whatever to the movement of evolution such however is spencer's illusion he takes reality in its present form he breaks it to pieces he scatters it in fragments which he throws to the winds then he integrates these fragments and dissipates their movement having imitated the whole by a work of mosaic he imagines he has retraced the design of it and made the genesis is it matter that is in question the diffused elements which he integrates into visible and tangible bodies have all the air of being the very particles of the simple bodies which he first supposes disseminated throughout space they are at any rate material points and consequently unvarying points veritable little solids as if solidity being what is nearest and handiest to us could be found at the very origin of materiality the more physics progresses the more it shows the impossibility of representing the properties of ether or of electricity the probable base of all bodies on the model of the properties of the matter which we perceive but philosophy goes back further even than the ether a mere schematic figure of the relations between phenomena apprehended by our senses it knows indeed that what is visible and tangible in things represents our possible action on them it is not by dividing the evolved that we shall reach the principle of that which evolves it is not by recomposing the evolved with itself that we shall reproduce the evolution of which it is the term is it the question of mind by compounding the reflex with the reflex spencer thinks he generates instinct and rational volition one after the other he fails to see that the specialized reflex being a terminal point of evolution just as much as perfect will cannot be supposed at the start that the first of the two terms should have reached its final form before the other is probable enough but both the one and the other are deposits of the evolution movement and the evolution movement itself can no more be expressed as a function solely of the first than solely of the second we must begin by mixing the reflex and the voluntary we must then go in quest of the fluid reality which has been precipitated in this twofold form and which probably shares in both without being either at the lowest degree of the animal scale in living beings that are but an undifferentiated protoplasmic mass the reaction to stimulus does not yet call into play one definite mechanism as in the reflex it has not yet choice among several definite mechanisms as in the voluntary act it is then neither voluntary nor reflex though it heralds both we experience in ourselves something of this true original activity when we perform semi-voluntary and semi-automatic movements to escape a pressing danger and yet this is but a very imperfect imitation of the primitive character for we are concerned here with a mixture of two activities already formed already localized in a brain and in a spinal cord whereas the original activity was a simple thing which became diversified through the very construction of mechanisms like those of the spinal cord and brain but to all this spencer shuts his eyes because it is of the essence of his method to recompose the consolidated with the consolidated instead of going back to the gradual process of consolidation which is evolution itself is it finally the question of the correspondence between mind and matter spencer is right in defining the intellect by this correspondence he is right in regarding it as the end of an evolution but when he comes to retrace this evolution again he integrates the evolved with the evolved failing to see that he is thus taking useless trouble and that in positing the slightest fragment of the actually evolved he posits the whole so that it is vain for him then to pretend to make the genesis of it for according to him the phenomena that succeed each other in nature project into the human mind images which represent them to the relations between phenomena therefore correspond symmetrically relations between the ideas and the most general laws of nature in which the relations between phenomena are condensed are thus found to have engendered the directing principles of thought into which the relations between ideas have been integrated nature therefore is reflected in mind the intimate structure of our thought corresponds piece by piece to the very skeleton of things i admit it willingly but in order that the human mind may be able to represent relations between phenomena there must first be phenomena that is to say distinct facts cut out in the continuity of becoming and once we posit this particular mode of cutting up such as we perceive it today we posit also the intellect such as it is today for it is by relation to it and to it alone that reality is cut up in this manner 
is it probable that mammals and insects notice the same aspects of nature trace in it the same divisions articulate the whole in the same way and yet the insect so far as intelligent has already something of our intellect each being cuts up the material world according to the lines that its action must follow it is these lines of possible action that by intercrossing mark out the net of experience of which each mesh is a fact no doubt a town is composed exclusively of houses and the streets of the town are only the intervals between the houses so we may say that nature contains only facts and that the facts once posited the relations are simply the lines running between the facts but in a town it is the gradual portioning of the ground into lots that has determined at once the place of the houses their general shape and the direction of the streets to this portioning we must go back if we wish to understand the particular mode of subdivision that causes each house to be where it is each street to run as it does now the cardinal error of spencer is to take experience already allotted as given whereas the true problem is to know how the allotment was worked i agree that the laws of thought are only the integration of relations between facts but when i posit the facts with the shape they have for me today i suppose my faculties of perception and intellection such as they are in me today for it is they that portion the real into lots they that cut the facts out in the whole of reality therefore instead of saying that the relations between facts have generated the laws of thought i can as well claim that it is the form of thought that has determined the shape of the facts perceived and consequently their relations among themselves the two ways of expressing oneself are equivalent they say at bottom the same thing with the second it is true we give up speaking of evolution but with the first we only speak of it we do not think of it any the more for a true evolutionism would propose to discover by what modus vivendi gradually obtained the intellect has adopted its plan of structure and matter its mode of subdivision this structure and this subdivision work into each other they are mutually complementary they must have progressed one with the other and whether we posit the present structure of mind or the present subdivision of matter in either case we remain in the evolved we are told nothing of what evolves nothing of evolution and yet it is this evolution that we must discover already in the field of physics itself the scientists who are pushing the study of their science furthest incline to believe that we cannot reason about the parts as we reason about the whole that the same principles are not applicable to the origin and to the end of a progress that neither creation nor annihilation for instance is inadmissible when we are concerned with the constituent corpuscles of the atom thereby they tend to place themselves in the concrete duration in which alone there is true generation and not only a composition of parts it is true that the creation and annihilation of which they speak concern the movement or the energy and not the imponderable medium through which the energy and the movement are supposed to circulate but what can remain of matter when you take away everything that determines it that is to say just energy and movement themselves the philosopher must go further than the scientist making a clean sweep of everything that is only an imaginative symbol he will see the material world melt back into a simple flux a continuity of flowing a becoming and he will thus be prepared to discover real duration there where it is still more useful to find it in the realm of life and of consciousness for so far as inert matter is concerned we may neglect the flowing without committing a serious error matter we have said is weighted with geometry and matter the reality which descends endures only by its connection with that which ascends but life and consciousness are this very ascension when once we have grasped them in their essence by adopting their movement we understand how the rest of reality is derived from them evolution appears and within this evolution the progressive determination of materiality and intellectuality by the gradual consolidation of the one and of the other but then it is within the evolutionary movement that we place ourselves in order to follow it to its present results instead of recomposing these results artificially with fragments of themselves such seems to us to be the true function of philosophy so understood philosophy is not only the turning of the mind homeward the coincidence of human consciousness with the living principle whence it emanates a contact with the creative effort it is the study of becoming in general it is true evolutionism and consequently the true continuation of science provided that we understand by this word a set of truths either experienced or demonstrated and not a certain new scholasticism that has grown up during the latter half of the nineteenth century around the physics of galileo as the old scholasticism grew up around aristotle End of section 21. End of Evolution Creatrice by Henri Bergson. Translated by Arthur Mitchell.